one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You can be seated. We will call our commission meeting to order. This morning, we have a presentation uh, from, on collaborating, engaging, and delivering from our community and economic development director, Brian, Interim Brian Lewis. Interim Brian Lewis, thank you. <laughs> I slid it in. <laughs> you did, yes. Thank you, good morning. It's, it's so refreshing. It, you look all crammed in up there. I know. Yes. But it is nice to be able to see you all on the dais instead of split apart. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, Brian Ruiz, Interim Director of the City's Community and Economic Development Department. Rather than devote this presentation to a single topic, we thought it appropriate to provide a broad overview of the Department's activities and accomplishments from fiscal year 2021. A retrospective of sorts, collaborating, engaging, and delivering on the quality of life promise that is the City's mission and the right of every Lakelander as one of, if not the most prominent public facing departments of the city, the CED team prides itself in providing unparalleled service to a diverse and growing customer base. Quite simply, everyone who lives in, works in, or visits Lakeland is our customer, and we take that responsibility and their experience and satisfaction very seriously. And it all begins with the comprehensive plan which you adopted for the 10 year period ending in 2030 back in July. The comp plan is your growth management roadmap, providing the basis for not only land use and zoning decisions, but essential services like water and wastewater, parks and public spaces, and multimodal transportation infrastructure. It is the community's long range vision, but is also the foundational legal document for growth within the city. Seldom does a city commission agenda appear without at least one zoning action on it. And beyond the broad policies set forth in the comp plan, the city's land development code provides more specific guidance for implementation of the growth management principles and vision created by the comp plan. Those specific actions, usually on request of an applicant landowner, include but are not limited to small and large scale land use amendments, rezoning, conditional uses, annexations and dimensional variances. The examples shown here illustrate the growing complexity of cases as a result of a better informed and engaged citizenry and the build out of the city as the population continues to increase. And here I get to highlight a tool that we developed over the past year with much assistance from IT and their GIS team available to the public the development tracker pulls data directly from CED's track it system for user defined permits and projects across any geography and any fiscal year dating to FY 2014. Here I've grabbed a screenshot of the 82 planning projects from FY 21. Zoomed in, you can view greater detail on any planning and zoning action with a click of the mouse. Another critically important function of our planning team is historic preservation, led by Emily Foster. FY21 saw the adoption of new design guidelines for historic properties, which consolidated and updated several guidance publications the Historic Preservation Board and staff used to evaluate alterations to historic properties. Partially funded by a $50,000 grant from the Florida Division of Historical Resources, it is also a comprehensive education instruction and promotion document to the public. FY21 also saw major private investment in the redevelopment of the Garden District, almost two decades after its formation. Back to the development tracker, and not surprisingly, all 249 historic preservation project applications were confined to the boundaries of, the, of Lakeland's seven historic districts. Moving to our affordable housing office, led ever so ably by Annie Gibson, which has become the critical team for implementing the mayor commissioner's renewed commitment to development of affordable units, while at the same time managing almost $2 million in pandemic related assistance for income qualified renters and homeowners through what's been locally called the CARE program. 
Since the program was launched in May of 2020, 492 vulnerable families have received assistance, preventing foreclosure, eviction, and ultimately homelessness. The Housing Office has at the same time implemented the Affordable Housing Land Bank Program, having awarded 48 lots to qualified developer builders. 16 sales have been completed to date, with the ballots under contract and scheduled to close by year end. Four single-family homes are currently under construction, with six more projected to start by the end of this month. I should have said award-winning affordable housing land bank program, as we were just recently notified that the program will be recognized for creative organization development and funding by the Florida Redevelopment Association at their annual conference next week. Great. Another accomplishment of note, just last month, the City Commission approved eagerly anticipated changes to the City's Affordable Housing Incentive Plan, expanding the boundaries within which qualified developers are eligible for impact fee incentives and streamlining incentive administration by allowing staff to approve qualified applications. Finally, and straight from the City Commission's strategic plan, our Housing Office just finalized a new home maintenance guide to support new and existing homeowners in avoiding costly repairs resulting from deferred maintenance and ensuring their home and property are assets to their neighborhood quality of life. The guide will become standard issue at all home buyer education classes moving forward and will be uh, available to all via the web, city offices, and neighborhood association meetings. Neighborhood outreach, as you saw on the title slide, really epitomizes the work of the Community and Economic Development Department. Strong, healthy neighborhoods are the backbone of our community and really exemplify so much that is great about our city. The past year saw the retirement of longtime neighborhood outreach planner Lynn Simpkins and the ascension of her successor, Jonathan Rodriguez, who has not missed a beat in engaging and challenging existing and prospective neighborhood associations to take their place as true community partners. I credited the leaders of each of the offices and services I've mentioned thus far, with the exception of one, and that is Teresa Mayo, who has the distinction of leading them all as community planning and housing manager. Teresa's skill and experience and her passion for public service are true assets to the city and CED, and I consider myself lucky to call her a colleague and friend. Moving right along, CED is also responsible for coordinating review among eight different departments for subdivision and commercial site development. That is the civil engineered horizontal construction that precedes vertical building construction and includes water, wastewater and electric utilities, fire protection, transportation and access management, parking and landscaping. This is really where the rubber meets the road for project design and delivery, the nuances of which tie directly to quality of life. Back to the development tracker, here you'll see that de the development review team or DRT considered 156 such projects in FY21, including the new Orlando Health Site, Culver's Restaurant, and Hawthorne Ranch. Over a 20 plus year career, Chuck Barmby's name has become synonymous with transportation in Lakeland, but he has additionally become a key leader on the development review front, coordinating among countless stakeholders and shepherding major development agreements to ensure compatibility and quality design. And of course, transportation. For the commission, connectivity and transit availability are major goals. The Commission has embraced a philosophy of moving people, not just cars. A couple of smaller yet critically important CED offices are real estate and property information and business tax receipts. The Real Estate and Property Information Office is the addressing authority for the Lakeland Electric Service Area, often referred to as Metro Lakeland, <coughs> and processes requests for vacation of city easements and rights-of-way, as well as sale of city-owned property. 
Much of the work of the Commission's Real Estate and Transportation Committee originates from the Real Estate and Property Information Office. And as its name would suggest, the Business Tax Office processes new business tax receipts and annual renewals. They also work closely with the Planning and Business Development staff, as well as several other departments to help businesses avail themselves of city services. Another hugely visible CED service is that of the Community Redevelopment Agency, which for almost half a century has been reinvesting in and reinvigorating formerly blighted areas of the city in three redevelopment districts. First downtown in 1977, then Dixieland and Midtown in 2001. 2021 saw a great deal accomplished with CRA's assistance and the leadership of CRA manager Elise Drumgo, including the Mirrorton community, which is in excess of 90% complete. This is a really neat time-lapse video of Mirrorton construction from March 2020 until roughly March of 2021, and you'll note Christmas decorations and the summit cranes photobombing it. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Christmas didn't last very long. <laughs> there are the yeah. summit cranes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's cool. Cool. Other accomplishments include groundbreaking on the well, a collaborative small business resource center, completion of the Lake Parker shared use path. Dixieland Art Infusion Mural Project and support for significant downtown redevelopment projects at the former Nathan's Men's Store, the Gore Building, and the Gardens Apartments. Another noteworthy project that involved the CRA, our Housing and Code Enforcement Offices, was the redevelopment of the Vermont Avenue Apartments by Talbot House Ministries into Vermont Place. The before and after photographs tell the story better than I ever could, but I am pleased to announce that the affordable housing, that like the affordable housing land bank program, excuse me, the Vermont Place project will also be recognized by the Florida Redevelopment Association as an outstanding rehabilitation, renovation, or reuse project. Success often begets success. And for the CRA, that's manifested by property value increases that result from the CRA's reinvestment which increases lead to greater revenue for the CRA to reinvest, creating a cycle of prosperity that affects, that attracts, excuse me, private investment that again increases values and the CRA's revenues. Put another way, the more good we do, the more good we can do. Though perhaps not as glamorous or popular as the CRA, our building inspection division has by far the greatest number of customer interactions in CED. That volume, represented on the development tracker for FY21 here, creates tremendous pressure, but also key opportunities to deliver exceptional service. And as you can see from this graphic, they deliver it quite consistently. And in case you need a further confirmation that growth and development in Lakeland is strong, here you can see the commercial square footage permitted by fiscal year and residential, which of course continues to thrive with new residential units increasing by an average of 39% annually since 2017. 2021 actually saw three times as many homes as were constructed in 2017. Back to our commitment to the customer. I wanted to show you a couple of areas where our team has done an exemplary job. The first is express permitting, which was launched in November 2018 and represented our collective commitment delivered exclusively by our permit techs to process select residential permit applications in 30 minutes or less. They were apprehensive at first. 
but they far exceeded everyone's expectations and since have processed over 11,000 applications for express permit, express eligible permits with eight out of 10 processed inside 30 minutes. And the second is plan review. Though this chart looks like an EKG of my heart right now, <laughs> it's actually average plan review completion experience in calendar days since October 2017. What you'll note is that with rare exceptions, those reviews are completed within seven days, which has been our commitment to customers for more than two years now. On the inspection side, our building inspection team completed just short of 55,000 inspections in FY21, 98.8% of them the day they were requested by the customer. I don't tell them often enough, but our plan reviewers and inspectors do an amazing job completing their work so our customers can complete theirs. Chief Inspector Dale Marquardt is currently leading the building inspection team while we recruit a new building official, and he has done a superb job at furthering our customer commitment. Another rung down the glamour ladder, but every bit as critical to our quality of life mission, the Code Enforcement Division saw the retirement of longtime manager Jim Daney in FY21 and the promotion of his successor, Sonny Marshall. FY21 also saw Code Enforcement's continued focus on illegal dumping, with 91 separate dump sites cited and resolved <clears throat> excuse me, in an, in an average of 11 days with additional neighborhood association collaboration resulting in placement of no dumping signs at key locations. Code enforcement also resumed, very compassionately, enforcement of the sign regulations in August and continues to work with businesses to achieve compliance without the need for formal enforcement action. Speaking of popular, the Code Enforcement Division is also responsible for administration of the city's red light camera program, processing payments and assisting customers in person at Coleman Bush and over the phone, scheduling hearings and working closely with the Lakeland Police Department, the Clerk of Courts and the Tax Collector's Office in releasing, or excuse me, placing and releasing vehicle registration holds for unpaid violations. Wrapping up, here I've provided a sampling of the recent feedback we've received from customer satisfaction surveys. It is reassuring to get positive, constructive feedback, and we've just recently launched CED Just Rewards, a bi-weekly internal email blast to recognize the accomplishments and good work of our teammates. In a lot of ways, it feels like 2021 till 2020 to hold its beer. COVID continues to impact our work on a daily basis, and because CED is so public facing, and because so many public boards and committees are staffed and supported by CED, most that are required by law to meet in person, the exposure risks have been significant. Add to that the extreme volume I've outlined, plus the unexpected departures of some key staff members, not the least of which was our former director, now Deputy City Manager Nicole Travis, and I'm more than comfortable in saying we've had our hands full. Through it all though, our team, like our community, has persevered and continues to deliver exceptional service and support for the city's quality of life mission. So what's next for CED? More collaborating, engaging, and delivering, of course. Projects like redevelopment of the Oak Street lot, which is on your agenda this morning. Conti continued downtown investment development of West Downtown near the RP Funding Center and Bonnet Springs Park, including the Lakeland Intermodal Center and the Chambers Business Resource Center are great examples of the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. CED's work, much like the Commission's, is all about balance, balancing the rights and needs and expectations of those we serve, ensuring compatible, sustainable, responsible growth and development, neighborhood prosperity, and an exceptional quality of life for all. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity this morning to highlight the important work of the Community and Economic Development Department. We are indeed fortunate to have such an amazing team of selfless, committed, open-minded, problem-solving professionals delivering on that quality of life promise 
every day. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Well, Mr. Ruiz, this is a great report <coughs> and one for which we have much enthusiasm. As we know, too, as a commission, the reduced number of calls that four years ago mm -hmm. were, were not the case, you know, and the efforts that have been made that make this possible. And your results are marvelous. I know, too, you have even talked about as you continue to hone those results, maybe doing another seminar with some of the builders, and, and maybe you might speak to that a second. Yes, sir. We, we had uh, scheduled, uh, we called it a, a round table, I believe. Right. Uh, and we had it scheduled back in July, and COVID spike forced us to cancel. We wanted to do it in person, uh, just feeling like we'd get far better attendance and results from an in-person engaged uh, forum. Uh, but we will be rescheduling, of course, uh, I, as, as soon as it's safe to do so, which may be in the coming weeks. And, and that's continuous improvement, and that speaks to the fact that there's always ways to be better, and so we appreciate that as well. Question by Commissioner, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. And I was going to ask about that as well, the Builders Roundtable, and just encourage you and your team, Brian, to reschedule that. I think that's a great tool to get feedback from our contractors and builders and understand the reason for the, you know, canceling it the first time, but I uh, hope to see that rescheduled. And I, question about just your time as interim director, and certainly there's no shortage of activity that you and your team have done <laughs> this year, but is there an area that you would say going into 22 uh, where uh, we could improve or give more attention, more focus, something that you would like to see us do more uh, in a specific area? Maybe it's just been resources or um, for whatever reason. Well, I, it, it has absolutely been a welcome challenge to lead such a, a dynamic department. I mean, every day is an absolute adventure. Uh, you know, from the commission, you know, as well as I do, the infrastructure gaps that we have. And so to see the type of growth that we have seen continue, we have got to solve for those gaps, or at least have plans to solve for those gaps. But that's a part of your, your strategic planning process. Of course, that's a, a huge part of that. Your legislative workshop this afternoon will be a big part of that because we have uh, vital partners at the state and federal level that we have to work with on those. Um, but yeah, I can't single out like one thing in particular. It, it's been it's been tough being interim director and assistant director at the same time for the past four plus months. Um, but I, I've made it through. I think <laughs> my heart. I wasn't lying when I said that that graph looked like my heart. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and I want to just share, uh, and thank you for allowing me to do so, Mr. Mayor, but you know, since I've been on this diet for almost 12 years, I've constantly hear and have heard from different ones of us who sit here and make sure that our city is taken care of very well, not only just certain parts, but all over our city. And the challenges that we hear about, of course, how we can improve different things that come to especially buildings, uh, the building department, permitting, inspection, et cetera. And I must say, I've seen great change, you know, in the 12 years. So it just did not start happening in the last four years. Right. It's been happening even before that. Yes. It has probably seen more impetus, I would say, probably in the last five, six years. But certainly, you know, we can appreciate what has been done and what continue to be done, I think, in improving that area that we want to make sure, uh, uh, you know, all of us is involved with uh, the building process, that, uh, you know, as when it comes to development uh, and, 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 and uh, those who local developers are, and even outside developers are for Lakeland. And as you've seen, reportings have been made, we've become somewhat the jewel of, of, of I-4 almost. So I certainly appreciate what I've seen improved and uh, continue to be improved in the last um, number of years. Let me share, I, I had a concern, I know, and I've shared it before, how, you know, we, when the, um, I call the Crosstown was, was uh, put in place and we had that almost like a divide that separated certain parts of what North Lakeland and almost, uh, can you count, downtown Lakeland looked. But I sort of can appreciate now where I've seen with develop, developers coming to the table, support given by our city and uh, the staff to make sure that corridor does not look to be a separate kind of situation. You know, when people come into Lakeland, as they come into our, our, our arterial roads, 
they'll bring them into our core downtown. You want to make sure they see good things. And I've, and I've seen that improvement. So I want to say thank you to my fellow colleagues that want, that would approve these kind of, you know, um, develop, developments that are coming about. But certainly want to make sure people understand, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're, those little, I call little pockets, which can be somewhat blighted, have been approved. And we see that happen. So I want to say thank you for that as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Other comments from commissioners? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Madden. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Brian, and everyone who's here to um, celebrate all the accomplishments that you were able to highlight today. Um, certainly, you know, know that it is uh, during a season of growth that you all are busy every day. I loved, I loved what you said, that every day is an adventure. <laughs> I could, that really puts it into perspective. Um, and I also want to, you know, comment, certainly I haven't been here as long as Commissioner Walker for 12 years, but in the four years, I've been able to see how responsive you are when we take real life scenarios from customers, from citizens, and that's our job. Our job is elected, and I know sometimes it feels like we're just complaining, um, but we're really the voice of the people who go through the process that we create for them. And oftentimes, things that we create on paper uh, look wonderful as a solution, and yet when you go through the process, it's not maybe as wonderful um, for the customer experience. And so I just want to say how much I appreciate you having open ears, um, you know, being more collaborative, getting the express permitting, thinking outside the box. And I really hope, um, I know that often with the creative process, when you're so busy, whatever your profession is, you can lose that creative genius because you're just at pressure to put out fires. I hope that whatever it takes, you continue to carve out time for that creative genius to flow, that you take particular incidents that you hear and that every department has, that you foster that um, approach of that didn't go so well or, or that developer really had a key idea in that last thing. Or I really liked how when we worked in that scenario, we were able to integrate something and come up with a solution to provide support to that development in a, in a way we haven't done it before. That you're taking notes of those, every single person as a part of the team, I totally believe in that collective genius and that collaboration that you talked about. And every little idea and solution, if people feel like that's fostered and encouraged, and then there's time set, a time set aside for that strategic planning, that coming together to say, and, and to, to the public, you know, today's a perfect example. Most of the ordinances that we're going to be approving today came from just the things that we're talking about. Citizens going through the process, having questions or frustrations, staff trying to look uh, at, at it through a different lens and coming up with a solution, making a tweak where necessary, and um, whether it saves money through fee reduction or impact fee mitigation or uh, it, it, it's more everyone puts skin in the game when Chuck works with developers to add signalization or transit stop to solve some of the traffic issues. I just really um, can't say it enough how much I appreciate as someone who hears from the community that those concerns are listened to in such a way that our uh, community and builders and residents feel like we are all a team together. We are all building Lakeland together. And so I just you know, can't thank everyone enough for um, the solutions that you've already uh, highlighted today um, and that you'll just continue you know, that approach going forward. Thank you. And thank you for recognizing the, the contributions of the team and, and collaborative genius, because I can assure you there's no, no genius standing at the podium this morning. <laughs> or at any of these, by the way. <laughs> Commissioner Music. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say thank you because this is what I do for a living. So the, 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 the permit office and, and their struggles become our struggles and their success becomes our success. And we, we pull permits all around the state. Um, so when we pull our, our single trade permits and we use the express permitting, it's, it's amazing. And, and I just wanted to let those that aren't in the field and just see this as statistics, a real life experience is this, this works very well. And because this is what I do for a living, those are the people that reach out to me when they have an issue. And, and, and your group has been very good at responding because I just kick that right to you guys and, and I don't, I don't um, fear that it's going to be handled as well as it can be handled. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And 54,000 inspections in a year. 
98% of which are done on the same day, and all of which help protect our citizens' future safety, ensuring that what needed to, what, what we said we were gonna do is what got done, um, that's incredible. And it's a, it's a benefit that we have as citizens buying something some, somewhere in the future that we don't even realize that was the protection taken in place, and that's why that process is so important. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, City Manager Truss. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, great job, Mr. Ruiz. Appreciate the presentation this morning. I just want to point uh, out a couple of things, and the comments have already been made. You know, that's very unique about community and economic development. You know, when you look at the statistics here this morning and you see all of the permits and all of the inspections, you know, I can, I can tell you no two are alike. Every single permit and inspection is unique to itself. There's nuances with, with each one of them. So I know from time to time we run into, you know, some difficulties and, and, and things that we have to struggle to work through. And sometimes we hear about that. But by and large, the volume that's put, put out by community and economic development is incredibly impressive. And the feedback that we receive actually most of the time is very positive. It's just those times where we have the few that become very unique, very nuanced that we have to work through. Um, the transformation of the department uh, has been ongoing as Commissioner Walker um, spoke to. Certainly, uh, Ms. Travis, uh, my teammate now, um, was, a, was a big part of that in, in the last several years. And uh, we have an amazing staff down there that works with Mr. Ruiz, and, and Mr. Ruiz during his interim period has done a, a great job in leading that department with an amazing group of people. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And a round of applause to Nicole Travis, who helped point it that way. And it's great to have a team. Anything else you want to share, sir? Uh, just thank you to the city manager. Uh, th those challenging projects are when it is most critical that we collaborate and engage yes. and listen actively. Exactly. Excellent. Exactly. Excellent. So true. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I am going to move around front, and we're going to do proclamations, and I appreciate um, the opportunity for us to be able to do that. I'm going to move the proclamation order a bit. I'm going to bring Rex Syndrome up first, if that's all right with you all, because the Hughes family is here. <coughs> they are so wonderful to come every year to remind us of the importance of uh, Brett Syndrome Awareness Month uh, here in October. And so here to receive that proclamation as they come up is Ann Hughes and her family, Carly, Matt Hughes, Matt Hughes, Reed Hughes, Kathy Bork, and Charlie Bork. So, welcome again, and it is wonderful to have you here today. Thank you. Whereas Brett syndrome is a genetic neurological disorder that occurs almost exclusively in females, and whereas every two hours a girl is born with Brett syndrome, but its symptoms usually do not appear until the child is six to 18 months of age, and whereas a regression period leads to lifelong impairment with multiple dysfunctions, Speech is lost, seizures can develop, scoliosis occurs, many develop a regular breathing patterns, and more than half of the girls and women lose their ability to walk. The hallmark sign of Brett syndrome is near constant repetitive hand movements while awake. And whereas those diagnosed with Brett syndrome require maximum assistance with daily living activities, and whereas the disorder is not degenerative and biologic biomedical research is proving that neurological symptoms could be reversed even after decades of severe symptoms. And whereas with the discovery of the gene that causes Brett syndrome, research in the lab proves the theory of reversibility of the disease. The discovery of breakthrough testing models and the launch of multiple disease-modifying human clinical trials, we now reach an unprecedented and historic moment in time where we must support the truly life-changing research in front of us. And whereas we must continue our efforts in bringing awareness to the medical community, therapists, teachers, caregivers, and general public, and support researchers who are dedicated in finding a cure for Red Syndrome, now therefore IH William really must marry the city of Lakeland to hereby proclaim October 2021 as Red Syndrome Awareness Month in the city of Lakeland, and witness whereof I have assigned my seal. And then I'm going to hand this to you for a family picture, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to make comments. And I have to grab the mic to do that. Because if you like. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for all being here. We thank you guys for making it happen. It's just a 
little simple way we can honor Emily and everyone else who suffers with Rett syndrome. And I don't know if any of you know, but City Hall it was lit up last week purple. Our purple's our awareness color, so we appreciate that so much. We, we got really excited and about that. Do you know new research anything at all? There's several clinical trials going on right now currently. She doesn't meet the requirements for them yet, but we hope to be a part of some soon. So it's promising. Yeah, we have lots of hope. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. And if we could take a quick picture. Thank you all so much for coming. Next, we will do um, not, I'm sorry, the Florida City Government Week uh, recognition. And to receive that proclamation is Commissioner Philip Walker of the City of Lakeland, and he's going to come around front for this one. He is, by the way, the president of the Florida League of Cities. Pretty honoring for us in, the, in this town to be able to have you serving in that role, sir. Whereas city government is the government closest to most citizens and the one which creates the most direct daily impact upon its residents, and whereas municipal government provides services and programs that enhance the quality of life for residents, making their city their home, and whereas city government is administered for and by its citizens and is dependent upon commitment to and understanding of its many responsibilities, and whereas city government officials and employees share the responsibility to pass along understanding of public service and their benefits, and whereas Florida City Government Week offers an important opportunity for elected officials and city staff to spread the word to all citizens of Florida that they can shape and influence this branch of government, and whereas the Florida League of Cities and its member cities have joined together to teach citizens about municipal government through a variety of activities, I therefore proclaim Florida City Government Week in witness thereof. Your comments, sir? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to my colleagues as well for the support you all give uh, and have given for the number of years that I've been involved with the Florida League of Cities. And of course, what we want to make sure our citizens understand, we're here to make sure that we protect local decision-making authority. Because you all, of course, the citizens of our city and the 411 cities throughout the state of Florida are the ones that know what's best for your neighborhoods, your communities, and we'll make sure that, that those particular decisions are made, are made based on what you know you tell us. So certainly we appreciate you know, what you do tell us and how you tell us and what we can do to make sure not only Lakeland, but the entire, of course, state of Florida with 411 cities represented by the Florida League of Cities organization. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for the service you give to the Florida League of Cities. Thank you. Not a Lab Rat Day is next, and here to re receive that proclamation is Haley Cornett, Tobacco Policy Manager of Polk County, and Monica Livingston, Community Engagement Manager and SWAT Coordinator and SWAT Team. So come on up, and all their uh, uh, people helping to support that. Now this might be an odd name for a proclamation for, to, for <laughs> Not a Lab Rat Day, but let us explain why. Whereas in this year's Not a Lab Rat Day, Polk SWAT students working against tobacco, see it's a different SWAT team than you thought, <laughs> will host a chapter meeting to discuss the chronic health dangers that are in tobacco and e-cigarettes. And whereas exposure to addictive substances are especially risky for youth and young adults, the brain continues to develop until the age of 25 that explains a lot of things, by the way. <laughs> Just kidding. And, and substances as nicotine can impact this growth and cause lifelong complications, such as deficits in attention, cognition, mood disorders, loss of joy, and lowering of impulse control. And whereas not a lab rat day will be observed annually to bring awareness to e-cigarette use among youth, encouraging the youth to stand up against big tobacco and the e-cigarette industries and push forward for change within their communities. And whereas SWAT is Florida's statewide united movement of empowered youth working towards a tobacco-free future, an organization working to mobilize, educate, and equip Florida's youth to revolt 
revolt against deglamorizing big tobacco and e-cigarette use. And whereas SWAT's Florida's youth-led movement mission is to combat the tobacco and e-cigarette industries and encourage their peers to protect themselves and future generations from nicotine by fighting back. And whereas in 2020, 21.6% of high school students in Florida used e-cigarettes, and for middle school students this figure was about 8%. While progress has been made in curbing youth e-cigarettes use in Florida, there's still much work to be done. SWAT members will be ready to spread the truth about e-cigarettes and get more of Florida's youth to quit for good. Since its inception, Not A Lab Rat Day has empowered youth statewide to stand up and declare, refuse big tobacco's negative impact on youth and young adults as the long-term health effects of tobacco and e-cigarettes. And whereas Not A Lab Rat Day will remain the ready to fend off big tobacco's plan to lure a new generation of polk youth into a lifetime of nicotine, away from a lifetime of nicotine addiction. Make a difference, join polk SWAT in the fight. I therefore proclaim, October 20th, not a lab rat day in the city of Lakeland. And, and who would like to speak on this topic? All right, you go first. Um, I'd just like to say thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the Board of City Commissioners. Um, I just want to appreciate how the city of Lakeland is always first in line to accept a proclamation, depending on the health week it is when it relates to tobacco, because that makes a big impact, and we need every voice we can to make sure everyone knows that we are here to deglamorize big tobacco so everyone lives healthy lives here in Lakeland and all across the state of Florida. So thank you. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Oh. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> and I'll take that back. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much to the City Commission for having us. Uh, my name is Haley Cornett. I serve as the Tobacco Policy Manager. Obviously, um, this is students working against tobacco, so the information that Kamaya shared is definitely um, more relevant coming from a youth who is, you know, in the schools and seeing the um, e-cigarette usage. So thank you so much to the city for having us, and we are looking forward to working with the city in a um, further capacity to end nicotine addiction and tobacco use here in Lakeland and in the broader Polk County. Thank you, and thank you. Well, this next one's kind of personally exciting for me. This is the proclamation to celebrate World Polio Day and recognize it. And we're bringing down the Rotary Club members that could come uh, today to be able to represent uh, this proclamation. And you can come right up front here with us. I have one of these red t-shirts this morning. It clashed with my tie, so I, I didn't wear it. But we, uh, the reason Rotary is involved in this is because Rotary was the organization worldwide, worldwide, that really worked to, against the eradication of polio. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, yes. All right, so there's a lot of flurry behind us there. Let me read this, please. Whereas Rotary is a global network of neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who unite and take action to create lasting change in communities across the globe. And whereas the Rotary motto, service above self, inspires members to provide humanitarian service, follow high ethical standards, and promote goodwill and peace in the world. And whereas Rotary in 1985 launched Polio Plus and in 1988 helped establish the Global Polio Eradication Initi Initiative, which today includes the World Health Organization, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, UNICEF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance to Im immunize the children of the world against polio. And whereas polio cases have dropped by 99.9 percent since 1988, and the world stands on the threshold of eradicating the disease, and I think it's Afghanistan that has maybe the most of what you can talk in that. Okay. And whereas to date, Rotary has contributed more than U.S. to the more than the U.S. 2.2 billion and countless volunteer hours to protecting more than the 3 billion children in 122 countries. And whereas Rotary is working to raise an additional 50 million per year, which will be leveraged for maximum impact by an additional 100 million annually from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
And whereas these efforts are providing much needed operational support, medical staff, laboratory equipment, and educational materials for health workers and parents, and whereas in addition, Rotary has played a major role in decisions by donor governments to contribute more than 10 billion to the effort, 10 billion. And whereas there are over 1.2 million Rotary members in more than 36,000 clubs throughout the world that sponsor service projects to address such critical issues such as poverty, disease, hunger, illiteracy, and the environment in their local communities and abroad. Now therefore, I H. William Mutz, Mayor of the City of Lakeland, do hereby proclaim October 24th, 2021 as World Polio Day and encourage all citizens to join me and Rotary International in the fight for a polio-free world. And here we have Mark to talk about that a little more. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Mark Skolnick from Lakeland, and I'm the District Foundation Chair, and it's my privilege to be here today and honor, and to actually have heard on the radio this morning that we have two countries left, Afghanistan and pa Pakistan. And in Afghanistan, the Taliban has agreed with the UNICEF to have a countrywide immunization starting next month. The last two countries. We expect the new WHO plan, we could be out of the polio problem in five years. Thank you very much. Pretty exciting. Thank you. Well, appreciate that opportunity this morning to address so many things that are uh, um, novel and important in our community that sometimes get overlooked. So thank all who helped participate in that as well. This brings us to municipal boards and committees and our uh, Commissioner Madden is chairman of that committee and will give the report. Thank you, Mayor. The municipal board committee met in the city commission chamber. Commissioner Stephanie Madden Chair, Bill Mayor Bill Mutz and Commissioner Sarah McCarley were present. Commissioners Mike Music, Chad McLeod were also present along with staff. The meeting was called to order at 8.20 a.m. and the purpose of the meeting was to receive and act upon the following recommendations. The Fire Pension Board of Trustees requests the City Commission ratify their appointment of Susan Buchanan to a four-year term beginning May 21st, 2021 and ending May 20th, 2025. Commissioner Sarah McCarley moved to ratify the Board of Trustees appointment. Mayor Bill Mutt seconded and the motion carried unanimously. On the Employee Pension Board, there was a recommendation from Sherry Watson to reappoint Rick Lilliquist to a three-year term beginning January 1st, 2022 and ending December 31st, 2024. Commissioner Sarah McCarley moved to accept the recommendation. Mayor Bill Mutz seconded and the motion carried unanimously. On the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee, there was a recommendation from Annie Gibson to appoint Damaris Stull to a three-year term beginning October 18th, 2021 and ending October 17th, 2024. Ms. Stull will serve as a person who represents a local planning agency. Mayor Bill Mutz moved to accept the recommendation. Commissioner Sarah McCarley seconded and the motion carried unanimously. There was also an appointment for Alex Craig to fill an unexpired term beginning October 18th, 2021 and expiring May 5th, 2022. Mr. Craig will serve as a person who represents essential services personnel. Commissioner Sarah McCarley moved to accept the recommendation. Mayor Bill Mutt seconded and the motion carried unanimously. 
On the CRA Advisory Board, there was a recommendation from Elise Drumgo to appoint Terry Coney to a three-year term beginning October 18, 2021 and ending October 17, 2024. Mr. Coney will serve as a representative for the Midtown seat. Commissioner Sarah McCarley moved to accept the recommendation. Mayor Bill Mutt seconded and the motion carried unanimously. On the Airport Advisory Board, there was a recommendation from Jean Conrad to appoint Randy Young to fill an unexpired term beginning eight, October 18th, 2021 and ending February 4th, 2024. Mr. Young will fill a citizen at large seat. Commissioner Sarah McCarley moved to accept the recommendation. Mayor Bill Mutt seconded and the motion carried unanimously. The Municipal Board's Committee discussed the upcoming municipal election for the canvassing board schedule and the quorum requirements. And as always, the city is accepting applications um, for the vacancies that we have. Interested residents may apply at our website, lakelandgov.net, Department City Clerk Municipal Boards Committees. We have these um, current availability uh, affordable housing advisory committees looking for a member who's actively engaged in affordable home building and one member who is an employer within the jurisdiction <coughs> and they must live within the city limits. Also, the beautification board is looking for three members and they also must live within the city limits. The meeting adjourned at 830. Which was just in time for our agenda study, so Absolutely. well done. Is there a motion to approve? Second. second. A motion to approve and a second. Uh, any comments by commissioners? Any comments or questions by the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. That brings us to the approval of the consent agenda. Items marked with an asterisk. Move for approval. Second. Motion to approve in a second. Discussion by commissioners. Any discussions or questions by the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. That brings us to the uh, request to appear from the general public formally, which are, there are none today, and there is also not an equalization hearing. So item number three, public hearings, A, ordinances, second reading, item one from our city attorney, Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have a, a number of ordinances for uh, second reading and consideration of adoption today. The first is proposed ordinance number 21-030, an ordinance relating to civil service, repealing certain ordinances, exempting officers and employees from the civil service system in order to provide for the consolidation of all such exemptions by resolution, providing an effective date. Move approval. Second. second. Motion to approve in a second. Discussion by commissioners. And discussions or questions by the audience. Seeing none, this is a roll call, call vote. Commissioner Walker. Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. So unanimously passes. Next is uh, proposed ordinance number 21-043, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Lakeland, Florida, relating to the Land Development Code, <clears throat> amending Article 4 of the Land Development Code to adopt uh, development standards for collection and donation bins, allow for the use of shipping containers as, as accessory structures for certain commercial uses, and expand the parking exempt area within downtown Lakeland, making findings, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Move for approval. Second. Motion to approve in a second. Uh, discussion by commissioners. I'll make a comment. As we're going through each of these items, these are things that we have spent a lot of time developing and the Community Development Department has made recommendations <coughs> that we've spent time discussing. And so we, uh, if, if you have any questions on them, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, it is something that we have spent a, a good deal of time in, so we're comfortable in going through them on a, what might seem a rapid rate otherwise. Uh, and it, yes, I just want to add to that that you know often people are asking me or they're or they're talking about transparency and things <clears> of that, and so I'm always saying like you all come to the meetings, um, but if they go to the the link, they can not only see all these notes, but there's a hyperlink inside there, and they can get all of that information. So not only has the stuff we've seen before, but it's something they can certainly all see as well. And and agenda study meetings, which are also posted, have a lot of this discussion as well. Okay, that being said, um, uh, any other. Questions or comments from the audience? Okay, this is a roll call vote. This would be Commissioner McLeod. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Unanimously <coughs> passes. Next is uh, proposed ordinance number 21-044, an ordinance relating to the Land Development Code, amending Article 9 and Article 13 of the Land Development Code to address subdivision review and planning requirements, adopt standards for splitting lots and parcels, and allow for the development of non-conforming lots under certain conditions making findings, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve and a second by Commissioner McLeod. Discussion by commissioners. 
Uh, Commissioner Reed. Do you think it would be apropos if we had Teresa come up and go over some of these particular issues, particularly in four and five? I think it's mm -hmm. uh, sure. uh, quite in depth. And like hit the highlights of those, please. Okay. Yes. Teresa. Oh, there she is. I could not see you. <laughs> Are we currently on three? Is that the one that was just yes, read? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this uh, group, oh, Teresa Mayo for the record with Community and Economic Development Department, um, this set of uh, recommended changes to the Land Development Code are specific to our subdivision standards and providing clarification on when projects need to go through a subdivision review and also to address when there are nonconformities um, created through the splitting or uh, joining of lots. So this lays out a process for that. Um, so that we don't create issues that can impact other adjoining property owners when those parcel splits or joins occur. And I don't know if there's any additional questions related to this one. So the subdivision has been created, then all of a sudden two individuals sell lots or subdivide them, and this is the process for that. Any other comments from the audience or questions? Seeing none, Commissioner Walker. Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. <clears throat> All right, unanimously passes. Next Number is four. proposed ordinance number uh, 21 045, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Lakeland, Florida, relating to the Land Development Code, amending Article 2 and Article 5 of the Land Development Code to adopt development standards allowing for the use of ship containers as dwelling units in mobile home and, and multifamily zoning districts and as accessory structures for certain commercial uses. Amending standards for home-based business, uh, businesses in response to recent legislative changes, clarifying parking standards for boats, trailers, and RVs on residential property, revising standards pertaining to personal wireless service facilities in limited development zoning districts, making findings, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Motion to approve. M motion second. to approve in a second. Um, comments by commissioners? Uh, if you don't miss, miss my out. Sure. mind talk about the pressure that's created this kind of desire please so um, this grouping of standards um, is really to provide greater flexibility in terms of use and um, particularly with the use of shipping <coughs> containers as um, dwelling units in multifamily zoning districts and then also within mobile home parks so this creates greater flexibility in the types of units that can be used um, aside from traditional construction methods uh, Commissioner Reed. Thank you. Uh, briefly, on, <clears throat> on Friday, we addressed uh, a tiny homes in RV parks. Uh, and I didn't think about it, but if, if somebody has a, uh, a uh, storage shed, I mean, not a storage shed, but I mean, you're, you're uh, I'm looking here for it, the big iron box up here, your shipping, uh, container. shipping container. Would those be on wheels too? If they went up, would they have to be, or would they be, we talked about tiny homes having to be on wheels. Would the shipping container have to be on wheels as well? No, it does not. And the intent here is for these to actually be placed on a permanent foundation. Um, so in the case of a multifamily use, they would be, have to meet the Florida building code, um, be engineered so that they could be combined together and then be on a permanent foundation. Um, there's another set of changes proposed later on that deal specifically with RVs, so those types of units that would be brought in on a chassis. Thank you. So these are the ones that are permanent, not the mobiles. Yeah, Commissioner McLeod. I didn't know. Okay. You had that look that I thought. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions by commissioners? Any by the audience? This is a roll call vote. Commissioner McLeod. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Uh, next. Next is proposed ordinance number 21 046, uh, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Lakeland, Florida, relating to the Land Development Code, amending Article 5 of the Land Development Code to revise development standards for new mobile home parks to allow uh, smaller development site areas, smaller lot sizes, and greater density 
as a conditional use, allow for the use of shipping containers as dwelling units in new and, and existing mobile home parks as a conditional use, and allow for the use of tiny homes and recreational vehicle parks and spaces des designated for recreational vehicles in existing mobile home parks, uh, making findings, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. And on Friday, we discussed uh, there is a provision in, in this ordinance that allows for the replacement of, of, of mobile home units in a non-conforming mobile home park or subdivision uh, and it requires that that uh, any replacement unit be no more than 10 years old and I think the discussion on, on Friday at a Jenna study was to allow those units to be uh, at least uh, no more than 25 years old which brings them within some changes that were made as a, resp as a response to Hurricane Andrew and, and, and some HUD requirements. Uh, so if that is the desire of the commission, that uh, would need to be part of uh, your motion to approve this ordinance. <clears throat> so move, motion. motion to approve with second. that conditional yes. change of 25 years and a second. Okay. Discussion by commissioners. Commissioner Reed. There again, you know, it's, it's, uh, if we do 10 years or 25 years, does that start back from today? Because right. I know the so code change is like in 73. Uh, so in 10 years from now, it's going to be 35 years. I'm just trying to get perspective on is it going to be 73 model or is it 73 and newer or 25 years from 2025? It's 25 years from the date that the permit is applied for for the replacement of the unit. So we wanted to keep it as a rolling 25 years to make sure that there's continually newer units coming in um, and knowing that if there are some changes going forward in, in building code or other things like that, that we would have to come back and you know, make some amendments to adjust that. But we also didn't want to tie it to a specific year, um, again, for the flexibility. Thank you. Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. And Teresa, you and your team, you, you didn't have any concerns about <coughs> moving that threshold from 10 to 25, correct? No, and, and particularly after hearing from some interested parties as to the reason for it <coughs> um, related to inventory, uh, we felt it was reasonable to extend it to, uh, from 10 to 25. Commissioner McCarley. I, I was just going to add that it broadens for the public at large. It broad, broadens the inventory of manufactured homes so that you have one that's a little more relevant and a little more up to date, even though it sounds like a long time. They've been built so much better and the, the technology of them. And in that rolling date, I just want to affirm that, that it starts from the day of the permit um, so that you're continually looking back 25 years and you're not locked into a specific year. So I think that's correct. That, that was great for staff to come back with that information. Thank you. Any other comments by commissioners? Commissioner Men. Um, thank you, Mayor. And, and I do reiterate what the mayor said at the beginning, that we did have a lot of discussion in our agenda study and even on the first reading with regard to all of these. And to reiterate what we said when we heard from the CED uh, presentation this morning, that all of these came from, like Ter Teresa Maya just mentioned, having you know conversations, not just from a staff perspective, or from a utopian uh, perspective, but really working with developers, property owners who have mobile home parks, who would like to improve those, who have not been able to in the past because of our land code, and really negotiating terms that are best going forward for Lakeland that give improvement to the property that we have, but also still have some regulations that, um, you know, kind of contain those um, opportunity so I, I just am really I just can't say it enough how much I appreciate our team each one of these um, came from dealing with citizens builders developers uh, to to work together to come up with the solution to get to a yes and so I am just really grateful so thank you so much for this today and I appreciate moving to the 25 years based on citizen concerns any other comments by commissioners? Commissioner Walker. I just emphasize again, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for allowing me to do so. That's why it's important for us to listen to our citizens and protect local decisions we make in authority. Yes, sir. That's right. And keep that from running statewide. <laughs> um, any comments from the audience? Okay, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner McLeod? Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 All right, uh, next is, is proposed ordinance number 21 047, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Lakeland, Florida, relating to the Land Development Code, amending Article 3 of the Land Development Code to amend design standards for attached garages on single family and two family dwellings, making findings, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Move for approval. Second. Motion approved in a second. Discussion by commissioners. Any discussion or questions by the audience? Seeing none. 
Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Unanimously passes. Next is proposed ordinance number 21-048, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Lakeland, Florida, relating to the Land Development Code, amending Article 10 of the Land Development Code to provide clarification regarding the concurrency determination process and adopt review requirements for major traffic studies, making findings, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Move approval. Second. Motion approved in a second and discussion by commissioners. Commissioner Madden. Thank you. Um, Teresa, could you um, give us some conversation just around this part? Traffic is such a big issue and with growth that's um, projected and expected, it is will continue to be um, so. And so I actually have citizens who are surprised that when we do have uh, developments coming that we do traffic studies uh, you know that is something that's reassuring that they know that we are doing that to do those modeling and pro uh, projections um, but if you could just give up give us a little bit more information on this one just for public um, the majority of these amendments to the land development code aren't really necessarily changing anything that we don't already do today or that Chuck doesn't do today through his review of developments um, what it does is consolidate where we have those requirements for traffic studies through several different documents so from our comprehensive plan or land development code and also just practice that um, is done today through the development review team so this outlines more clearly for developers what the expectations are and when those traffic studies are needed and what thresholds are triggered um, for them to provide those studies so we get them at two critical times within the development process the first being um, when there's a zoning change, um, for example, a planned unit development that has some significant impacts, there is a tra some traffic studies required at that point, depending on the use, and then also the number of trips that would be generated by that particular use or development. Um, and that kind of ties in what we call a non-binding concurrency determination, which says at a preliminary stage, yes or no, as to whether there will be significant impacts to um, the traffic network as a result of that development. As projects then come forward into the development review team and they're going through their actual um, site plan review for construction, um, that's when those traffic studies are relied upon to lock in what exactly the impacts will be at that time and then also what types of mitigation will need to be provided as a result of those impacts. Um, so it's kind of in a nutshell what the changes are. Um, I, I don't know if Chuck is here, if you had any specific technical questions about that, but this is really consolidate all those different um, processes into one location within the land development code, and then also provide the clarification for developers. And the purpose of all that is to project when failure is likely to occur based on relatively predictable loads based on what we're putting in in terms of zoning. Commissioner Music, do you have a comment? Nope, I was agreeing. All right, okay. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to finish. So, oh, sorry. But just like a segue into the next point is that um, I'd mentioned at another meeting how powerful I feel as an educational piece and as a tool if there is a uh, technology that we could show the modeling, mm -hmm. um, especially since it's citizen-based. I know that when we've made advancements with e-track it, we're trying to make new technological advancements all the time to be a smarter city. I think that that would be something that would be really great, not just to say Chuck has done a traffic study and this is the number and this is what he's finding and putting it on a graph, but actually showing the modeling of the traffic projected as we're growing, I think would be a powerful tool. To yes. Just even seeing the heat map on how many um, permits that you've pulled, that is a bigger impact on me, a decision maker, when I can see that. I think that the same is true when you have developers and they're frustrated potentially about having to buy a bus or um, put in signalization or, or to partner in paying for some of these mitigation strategies, that it, it is going to be very important for us to give them as clear of a picture as possible as what the ramifications are going forward with the growth that we're going to have. Yeah. And I think working together with the GIS team in, in Do It, um, there's something that we could develop that does just that mm -hmm. um, and would show it graphically on a map um, so that it could be better understood not only by the development community but by the residents who we continually hear from that you know traffic is getting worse and and show them what it means you know there's and Chuck I hear I know he makes the comparison between there's congestion and then there's you know um, traffic failures so to make it clear what that exactly means um, and where those locations are 
I, I put down a, a sheet that is not related to this presentation, but shows the kind of example that I think Commissioner Mann is talking about on a Polk County basis. This is very interesting because that reflects the last 10 years of just new housing starts. And the red, of course, and, and Lakeland is to the left, and you can see I-4 going across the top. Uh, yellow is hotter, red's the hottest in the Point Sienna area. So you look at that, those kinds of things we can do right there, yes. But that's the kind of growth in 10 years that's happened and we're growing at a faster rate. You heard that we had three times the permitting of the prior year, this year. And so when you think about that, those loads and where they are, uh, are the kinds of things that we've got to be able to project well and for citizens to see. Um, I was in a, to further augment Commissioner Madden's point, I was in one of the um, discussions about the election coming up where they said if you could ask for one magic pill, one thing to be done, and there's so many priorities, you know, in a community that you think about. And if you were doing one magic pill, the thing I said was roads. You know, if you can if you can facilitate roads and the growth that we would have coming forward, then it lets people be able to move well, and much of that has to lag and follow. These are the kinds of tools I think you're looking for, only even localized mm -hmm. within the particular mm -hmm. subdivision. And even just moving modeling, like when you see the modeling for the projections of COVID uh, spread and contagion, you know, just watching dots on a road increase and accelerate um, and even to be able to compare road to road so you know how it feels to drive along uh, South Florida even with regard to the road diet and things like that sometimes you might feel more frustrated than actually you know if you compared it to another road you might have a, a freer flow of traffic and less constraints than you perceive you know because it's you're in the middle of construction or whatever but I just think that uh, some kind of traffic modeling software or, you know, solution would be really Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll coordinate with, um, with do it and um, GIS and see what we can come up with. Okay. All right, any other comments by commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Reed. Thank you. <clears throat> there again, um, addressing roads you know, on the TPO board, which we're all members of, and uh, the last oh, three years I've been an advocate trying to get the state to increase our gas tax. There's been a pushback. Obviously, we haven't been able to get a gas tax, but, you know, we're getting pretty good gas prices gouged right now anyway. But invariably, if we could, it's, if we had more revenue, we could build more roads. But, um, and the state has been somewhat hesitant to raise the gas tax. For, I have no reason, I don't know why, but uh, I've advocated it for years and it falls on deaf ears. So. Right, we're going to have to do something. That's correct. Mm -hmm. The other comments by commissioners? Any by the audience? Good discussion on this, Commissioner Mann. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McLeod? Aye. Yes? Aye. 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 Unanimously passes. The uh, final ordinance for consideration this morning is proposed ordinance number 21 049, an ordinance relating to zoning, making findings, approving a conditional use to allow for the demolition and reconstruction of a secondary school for grades six through eight on property located at 2815 Eden Parkway, finding conformity with the comprehensive plan, providing for severability, providing an effective day. Move for approval. Motion second. approved and a second by Commissioner McLeod. Second. And um, uh, you might want to show this slide if you could so that the public can anticipate what's occurring, the Southwest Middle School. <clears throat> so on the uh, left-hand side of this slide is the current campus master plan, and on the right-hand side is the proposed master plan, which switches the pointer to work, um, all of the uh, track and field activities from the north back of the campus up to the front of the campus along Edgewood, um, provides for additional uh, parking and queuing for parent pickup and drop off, and then an additional um, queuing area for school buses here, and then internalizes the campus buildings. So the school goes to the other side of the lot, and that is um, a two-year project about? I believe they want to begin construction um, first quarter of 2022. Okay. Discussion by Commissioners. Commissioner Reed. Thank you. 
I'm kind of sad. I drove my bicycle to school when I went there when I was in July. But it's, I'm glad they're going to have the, the, the uh, field back there. I hope they have lights and stuff too. But uh, it'll be a sad day to see the old school I went to transformed. I understand that, sir, and we appreciate your expression of emotion. <laughs> nostalgia. <laughs> nostalgia. <laughs> nostalgia. Nostalgia is what I couldn't get to. Thank you. Any other comments? Any comments or questions by the audience? Uh, Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Unanimously passes. There are no resolutions, and that brings us to the Community, community Redevelopment Agency. We cease meeting as a commission and begin, begin meeting as a Community Redevelopment Agency board. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have a, a couple of items for consideration this morning. The first is a request for mortgage forgiveness uh, related to the Parker Street Ministries uh, facility at 719 North Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, the CRA purchased this property back in 2010 from the Methodist Church for $500,000. Uh, the, the, the property at the time was subject to a lease uh, to Parker Street Ministries that the Methodist Church had with Parker Street Ministries. Uh, which uh, um, um, gave Park Street Ministries uh, uh, the, uh, a lease purchase option to purchase the property with a credit for any capital improvements that Park Street Ministries made to the property as well as any lease payments that, that uh, Park Street Ministries made. Uh, Park Street Ministries made lease payments from July of 2010 to February of 2012 and also during that time made approximately $1.1 million in capital investments in the property and then decided to exercise their purchase option to purchase the property from the CRA. Uh, with the uh, different credits that they were entitled to, uh, the balance remaining uh, owing to the CRA as a result of their purchase was $147,580. That was uh, put into a 10-year interest-free balloon mortgage note uh, uh, that is now becoming due uh, in February of 2022. So under, under this financing structure, they have not made any payments since 2012, uh, 2012 uh, but that is now all, all going to become due. So they have approached the CRA requesting some relief. Their original request was to simply uh, extend the, the, the payment out another 10 years with a declining uh, forgive, for forgiveness balance. Um, that was taken to the CRA advisory board. Uh, the, the advisory board, and, and let me back up just a little bit, the condition of that 10 year declining uh, mortgage balance was that Park Street Ministries continue to do the, the work that they're doing in the neighborhood, which has been significant over the last number of years. Uh, the advisory board uh, decided that, that uh, they would prefer to simply forgive that now, uh, that there's really not a whole lot to be gained by holding them to this obligation to continue to perform the work that they're already performing. They're well established in the community. So the advisory board's recommendation has, has been to just simply uh, forgive that balance now uh, the staff is in agreement with that recommendation, so that is recommended for your approval. I don't know, at least if you have any questions uh, or, or any uh, anything to add to that, or if, you, if the commission has any questions of the lease. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commission, and uh, City Manager as well. Uh, I, I stand for questions, uh, or uh, if you have any, but uh, I don't have anything to add. Uh, City Attorney has covered everything there. Um, you know, Parker Street Ministries is very grateful for uh, any consideration you may have for them today. Move for approval. Second. All right. Motion to approve in a second. Commissioner Reed, question. Thank you. On Friday, uh, I approached the uh, hesitancy of uh, forgiving the note to set a precedent stamp. And of course, there again, uh, that's my only issue. They do a great job. They've done a ma big investment in the area. They've done a uh, lot of activity in the area. It makes it a good organization. But I just, uh, I'm teetering on the setting of precedents for forgiveness. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why y'all decided to do that? Well, uh, you know, we, we did want to support. You know, Parker Street Ministries has been in the community for 25 years. They've been in the community mm -hmm. since before the CRA was established in Midtown. Um, but, you know, they've done a, a ton of work and they are key to recruiting homesteaders and participation in CRA programs. They also engage in uh, you know, neighborhood cleanups and, and provide services to the community from, um, from financial literacy 
to how to maintain homes and, and just very basic upkeep of the community and that network that we have uh, in the Parker Street neighborhood, they are integral to that. And so, uh, you know, when we originally brought this forth to the board for consideration and we said, let's consider it at 10% at over 10 years, provided they continue the work. Well, they've done the work uh, before we were established and they don't appear to be going anywhere. And so, um, you know, the, the board's discussion at that time was that uh, it, it was something that was looked upon favorably. And so uh, we don't hold other notes uh, like this over uh, other entities that are not for profits. Uh, we do hold notes on other properties that are owned by private residences, but uh, our, our advisory board did have a recent review and we ended up satisfying some of those uh, mortgage mortgages as well because of the length of time and some of the obligation uh, that were required from those homeowners. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know that it'll bring forth any additional uh, problems for us, Commissioner. I guess the only hook I would think about is if we carried it for 10 more years, we know they're going to be there. They do a great job, and they're again, if we forgive this, they might up and sell the building tomorrow and move. Commissioner McCarley. I would just say, just from knowing Parker Street and working with them over the last several years, that they are an anchor institution in that corner and in that neighborhood, and that they've done their return on investment, not just in people, but even in property values and having a good anchor and handle on the community at large and serving it. I don't, from their board of directors and interacting with their staff, I don't see them hightailing it out of here anytime soon until their work is complete. If their work is complete and they fulfill their mission, then obviously, you know, we would all hope that that happens in five years. I don't think that's realistic. I think it'll, you know, continue on and have a ripple effect. But from a nonprofit standpoint, they do this more efficiently. They serve that community more efficiently than any government ever could. Um, so, and I think this and the, the scheme of their budget and the scheme of what they have put into that neighborhood in the last 25 years um, is really just, Oh, they're a great organization, and I, I just think that it won't set a precedent because they have so much skin in the game. Um, I don't think that they're going anywhere. I understand your hesitation about setting a precedent, but I think for this kind of um, nonprofit, because they are so far reaching and so ingrained, I don't see them. If you're talking about a nonprofit that had one program, they are community minded, community driven, and they are shepherding that community, I think, in a really pro positive way for the city of Lakeland. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I would agree to uh, Commissioner McCauley. I, I, I too thought about, as Commissioner Reed alluded to, you know, about the forgiveness and setting precedent. But after hearing what Mr. Drumgo is sharing with us about this being the only one, I thought, well, okay, then well, maybe we won't have the precedent set as such. But you look at what that community has become in its ministry. And I, I know sometimes I may say some things that may not be likened to what people think, uh, but I know as far as my life is concerned, ministry is what you need. And they have given that to that community. They have done that, and they continue to do that. And you've seen lives changed. You've seen you know, the area which was, I don't know how many of you all can know about that area, because I don't know how much you come into it. I'm sure you do, but years before, how it was it's awful. and how it is today. And not only that, how they even taken the resources that they have uh, been able to uh, acquire through their particular program to other components, other areas, to be of support as well in ministry. So I think it's important that we don't forget that because those, you can't pay for that. There's no dollar amount you can even set to that. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in the dollar amount and we forget about the lives, the area, the components that go on and on for years to come, and you can't set a dollar value to it. So I did have a problem initially, I must say, because I was concerned about all we said in President to his uh, Commissioner Reed. But I think after hearing what Mr. Drumgo has shared and what we know has happened, um, I, I, my mind changed. Commissioner Music. Yeah, and I'm just going to echo, I think, what everybody else said, but you know, um, if, if we can get other ministries that are going to be as um, beneficial as this, that are going to invest not only the human capital but the financial capital, I think it's, well, I, think, I think I'd forgive that money every time. 
right? If, if, if we see this and, and following up with the CRA. But let me make sure I understand this. So when they met in September, they were planning on forgiving it anyway. It was just going to be over a 10 year period. Okay. Right. We're just looking and saying, let's just get rid of this. And then to your point, you're okay. saying, what's the rush? If they're going to be there for 10 years, why, why rush and forgive it now? So I would probably go forward. I will go forward with approving that, but I, I certainly agree with the, the fiscal question, you know, idea of that for certain. Commissioner McLeod. Thank you. Good discussion. And I think at our uh, advisory board meeting, Tim Mitchell and Parker Street, they would uh, agree to the 10 year deal and then they understood the reasoning behind that. Uh, but he said, we're very grateful for the immediate forgiveness to the question of, are we going somewhere? He said, we are ingrained in the neighborhood. We're planted there. We're not going anywhere. He said, I don't plan to go anywhere anytime soon. My staff, we, we are there. And the initial discussions, I think the board was open to the 10 year deal as well. But when somebody suggested, why don't we do an immediate forgiveness? Some of us may not be on the CRA advisory board in 10 years. And just to go ahead, if we're heading in that direction, and when that idea was suggested for the reasons that have been mentioned, it received unanimous support. So um, I think it's good discussion, but uh, everyone felt very comfortable with the recommendation before us today. Really yeah, Commissioner McCullough. I just want to add too, for people that don't know, the um, part of Parker Street has intentional residents. So there are people who are maybe not from that neighborhood who come in and buy homes in that neighborhood and live in that neighborhood. So that it is more of a holistic approach in a community. And I would I would say that people who are intentional residents, their lives are just as impacted by being there in a positive way as people whose families have been there for a while. So it's very much a a blend of all different types of Lakelanders who are coming together to serve that community. And I just think sometimes that gets missed. So that goes back to the ingrainment and to how they're not going to pick up and sell houses and move out of that neighborhood anytime soon. And, and I appreciate the um, uh, precedent pause because I think it's a good question sure. always for us to ask. Sure. Any other comments by commissioners? Any by the audience? All right. And, this and is a. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please. I'm yes, sorry, good. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I just. Just what Commissioner McCarley said, too, on the recruitment of residents to move into that neighborhood. You know, part of what we do when we talk about mitigating blight is trying to get folks to move into communities. And having Parker Street Ministries as a partner in doing that, they've done it successfully and convinced folks to engage in our programs. They've also acquired and demolished property over the years and in just the last three years. You know, they've demolished several blighted properties and then they've acquired property from the CRA as well in order to further uh, grow their campus and, and services in the neighborhood. So, uh, again, thank you for the consideration on this item. All right. Any other discussion by the audience on this? <laughs> Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Unanimously passes. <clears throat> the second item for consideration is the selection of a developer to negotiate a, a development and disposition agreement with uh, relating to the Oak Street parking lot and uh, a lease is going to have a, a, a brief presentation on this. All right. Uh, again, uh, this is for development of the Oak Street parking lot owned by the CRA. Uh, the existing site is a full city block, approximately an acre and a half. Uh, currently, we use a site. It's 150 parking spaces that are leased out. Uh, we issued a request for proposals for or a request for qualifications for this property uh, about two years ago, and we ended up uh, issuing that uh, initially to Catalyst Group, a uh, group out of Tampa. Uh, they withdrew their proposal uh, last year around this time. So in consideration for uh, some additional interest, we ended up issuing a request for proposals, uh, 1258 here in July. Uh, staff received, uh, we received two proposals, one from Onyx Group, which is a Tampa-based group. Uh, the second from True Investors Development, which is a Lakeland-based group. Uh, they were ranked one and two respectively. Uh, the selection committee comprised of, excuse me, was comprised of uh, uh, some city staff and also we had a commissioner uh, on the committee as well. We had a private citizen and advisory board member. Uh, and I'll give you just a little bit of uh, background about, about Onyx Group and what they intend to do. Uh, again, they have several uh, projects in the hopper, uh, but what they're proposing for the site uh, is a six story, it's a precast uh, concrete structure, approximately 400 parking spaces. 150 of those spaces would be for lease to the city for public parking. Uh, in addition to that, it'll be a five story wood frame residential, approximately 153 units. Uh, 138 of those would be market rate, 15 of those would be for affordable housing. In addition, if you look at the site there, they've got some 
uh, some retail space with a sidewalk cafe on the, it'll be on your south and uh, east corner there. It's an outdoor cafe that's proposed for the site. <coughs> I'll just let that sit for a second so you can look at it. It's a motion to approve. So moved. Oh. Second. Oh, he's not done. He's done. I'm oh. sorry, I was just le letting he's that. Pausing. <laughs> <laughs> he's pausing. He's pausing. He's pausing. He's pausing. He's We do have a motion to approve it. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's continue your discussion. I'll move it along. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the developer is proposing some terms uh, uh, within, the, within their proposal. Those terms are uh, just over a million dollars for the acquisition of the property. They're requesting uh, tax increment financing rebate over a 10-year period. Uh, the first five years would be 90%. The second five years would be 70%. They're seeking full impact fee credits uh, to include water and sewer. And then also they're requesting that the city enter a 25-year lease agreement on those parking spaces uh, with 5% ex escalations every five years. So uh, the, the development agreement, uh, we're looking to have that executed by the end of March uh, with design and permitting being completed uh, around this time of next year. Construction would be completed uh, within their proposed timeline in two years. Uh, and what we're seeking today is a recommendation from City Commission um, acting as a CRA uh, to allow us to begin negotiations with the developer on this project. Uh, if we can reach those a mutual, mutually acceptable terms. If we cannot, uh, then we're, we would be negotiating with uh, the second rank developer. And uh, the developer is here today from Onyx Group and they don't expect to, to speak, but they're, they will listen and take your feedback uh, more than likely. And uh, I'll stop for any questions. It's important when we take a look at this and to make sure we understand the scope of it as we consider it as a commission, we're really just approving the fact that the selection committee has made the choice and that they can begin the negotiations with the developer. And therefore, um, we don't get involved in that negotiation. That's what we have a community development department for, and they'll bring that specific uh, proposal back. That means that some of these variables are under discussion from both parties' parts, um, and uh, I'm not going to enter any particular point in this other than one suggestion personally that I'd like consideration for, which is to also exhaust whether or not a sixth floor might be economically feasible and the density created therein. Uh, as we think about our use of downtown space um, uh, and making sure we're maximizing each of the footprints and working on that, and it may or may not be, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in it. I'd just love to see that there'd be some discussion around that topic so, so maybe we could make that approval even for more units. Uh, Commissioner Reed. Thank you, thank you. Again, I'm, I'm gonna vote for the issue today um, again, on, on Friday, I brought up the fact that um, uh, I was the most senior member there on Friday. However, Commissioner Walker's here today, and this is the most aggressive TIF, TIF point component that, that I have seen asked by any developer. Yes. I would hope that they uh, sharpened their pencil, per se, in that, in that regard. Uh, the other question I have uh, is, on affordable housing, is it going to be 50% of our median income, 70%, 80%. What are we gonna consider affordable housing for this particular area? Sure, so, you know, of course there are ranges on the affordable housing. I want to say within this proposable, uh, proposal, it is up to 120% AMI. Um, so we're looking at workforce on the affordable component, uh, Commissioner, um, and you are correct in that the TIF is very aggressive. Um, I will say that, you know, as we get into the nuances of what, the, what it'll take to get the development done, uh, we'll start to ask the developer for some more refined numbers. Um, you know, I just ask that you keep in mind that we did have some requirements within this request for proposals, and a lot of what has been asked for is that we replace the existing surface parking. And so the developer is essentially going to construct uh, the, the, the sum of the parking uh, spaces and incur that initial cost up front. Uh, and so, you know, that, that is certainly, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's a huge ask. And so in understanding that, you know, the developer is uh, structuring the, the numbers in a way that will offset some of those upfront costs. Uh, so, uh, but I do have your, your note here on the TIF and then also looking at the, 
the viability of some additional uh, square footage on the sixth floor. On, uh, on Friday, I also uh, requested, I think they said we're looking at probably a forgiveness of about $453,000 in impact fees. Uh, that's going to, we're going to have to get that money from someplace. Um, and I'm not sure, is CRA going to give that $453,000? We're negotiating. I would say let us negotiate that, <clears throat> Commissioner. Uh, and, you know, there, there are some creative ways to do it. And just keep in mind that we have offset some of our other projects and developer uh, costs by uh, providing some of the land at the acquisition costs back to the developer as well. So, you know, we're still, we're able to, to work through those numbers and uh, we've paid for with particularly with the framework deal, we paid for some of those permit costs and some of the infrastructure costs with um, with some of the monies that we did receive on the land acquisition. So Good, okay, uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased we're going to de develop us moving that area. It, we need some more uh, apartments, obviously. Parking will be a big plus. And uh, I look forward to seeing what kind of deal you can negotiate. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Music. Yeah, so just as a, as a point of clarification, as I read this, what we are approving is for the team to negotiate. That's Correct. that's what yeah. we're approving. Okay. Commissioner Walker. I just want to make sure I heard something as well as reading as it did. But are you saying as I know for works work for workforce housing is what we really need a lot that I know. It's it's challenging I, as I hear different ones who uh, are employed here and I see they were can't afford to you know, pay for rent and that kind of thing. So as, as we move along in this particular uh, uh, effort, workforce housing is what we're looking at, but I think I heard the mayor, did you mention something about additional numbers being increased as far as units are concerned? Or, or uh, will that, if that be the case, would all that be aligned with making sure we get as much workforce housing as we can? We, we want to let them negotiate. That's the bottom. But that's that's that's. I got to so put question, it out. I, question, I have to put it out there. So. Yes, all right. <laughs> and, and your your comment is is heard, Commissioner. Uh, again, I just ask that you all consider what it takes for uh, a developer's pro forma to sure. work, right? And understanding that um, as we we get into the nuances of the, the cost of construction, it's the same for market rate. And so to have mm -hmm. someone who would like to come in and even offer a percentage of those units below market rate mm -hmm. is, uh, sure. I think is, is, sure. a, is a great, mm -hmm. uh, it's a great contribution. Um, and if we can certainly, you know, I, I can tell you that in order for us to get them lower, we would likely have to contribute more. And so when you consider what we're willing to contribute um, when we start the negotiations, um, that I'm certain that we can increase that ask on the affordability. Sure. Uh, so Thank just some you. things to have in mind, and uh, we'll we'll lock ourselves in the room with the city attorney and <laughs> sort through it. Excellent, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you. At least just a process question. This the negotiation, whatever is reached, will come back to the CRA advisory board right. as well before it comes to the commission. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Because I know we in that group asked many good questions on these topics. Uh, most recently, uh, you know, the project about the TIF and the amount. And how do we structure that? And so um, there's a lot of good insights on that board uh, that will weigh in before the final package were to come back to us. Thank you. We anticipate um, that the developer can make this a profitable project for them and want that. Sure. We want to make certain that um, we're good partners in the process of negotiating for the things that are important to us as a city and use of the footprint. And so we, in this approval that we would will be voting on, would just be voting on the fact that you can start that process. Mm -hmm. And um, you've heard our little tidbits of input <laughs> along the way and concern, uh, but we'll back ourselves out of that so that you can uh, proceed accordingly. Commissioner Madden. Uh, I would be curious if the developers would like to introduce themselves since they're here today. There you go. Hi, my name is Arjun Chaudhary. I'm vice president and partner at Onyx Development. Uh, this is an exciting project. We've, we've worked with a local architectural group called Lunds, Brad Lunds and Steve Boynton have been associates and partners for us in the, in, at this point of time, they're designing about eight projects for us. We're doing one in Lake Nona, which is 40 minutes um, uh, from here. Uh, we're doing one in, uh, I shouldn't be mentioning it, but still in Winter Haven. Uh, we're working very closely with the city. We've gone through multiple CRA applications and our asks are very calculated. 
and I understand that, that you know, it's, uh, prima facie, it seems like it's a, it's a heavy ask, but it's something that, you know, obviously I'm open to discussing with, with Elise and, 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 and the broader team, but our intent is not to do just this one project. We're here for the long run. You'll see a lot of us, and I'm hoping to, you know, uh, develop a long-standing relationship with, with the city of Lakeland. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for asking that question. Any other comments by commissioners? Anybody in the audience or questions? Seeing none, this is uh, uh, Commissioner voice vote. Uh, voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. That unanimously passes. That brings us to our city manager, and city manager Shouraus has a recommendation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I have just one item for presentation uh, this morning, and it is related to a uh, Lakeland Police Department mobile uh, command vehicle. The Lakeland Police Department, or, or LPD, is requesting to purchase a mobile command vehicle to be used during city events and emergency operations. Currently, the LPD possesses a 31-year-old antiquated Bluebird bus purchased decades ago. Originally used as a bookmobile bus, it was modified as a stopgap command vehicle about 15 years ago. The vehicle was never programmed into the replacement fund due to its condition and has reached a point where it is not practical to keep it as part of our fleet. Given the number of significant city <coughs> events, things like the Christmas parade, uh, the Sun in Front event, July 4th celebration and others, and also emergency operations that the LPD coordinates annually, having a mobile command vehicle will enable them to allow the incident command team a centralized location to oversee uh, the operations from that vehicle. These events take place all over the city. As you're aware, we have events downtown, out at the uh, airport, uh, over at Tiger Town, around Lake Morton and, and others. Uh, so having a, a mobile vehicle is a necessity. The command post is a highly important component of a successful critical incident response in the field as it serves as the central point of intelligence gathering, staff planning, and command control of any overall operation at hand. A clearly defined command post is in keeping with the best practices of the law enforcement profession and in line with the national model of the incident command system deployed by both police and fire at major scenes and events. Based on staff's review, it's recommended to purchase a command vehicle through Faber uh, Specialty Vehicles for $289,979. This quote is based on the specifications uh, that LPD provided uh, to meet their operational and budgetary requirements. The city's purchasing department has approved the purchase of the vehicle as a cooperative purchase pursuant uh, to Omnia Partners Public Sector Contract. Omnia Partners Public Sector serves as a municipal contracting agency and it enables cities and other governmental agencies to cooperatively procure equipment, products, and services in order to receive volume pricing discounts. The funding for this vehicle will be derived from the Federal Law Enforcement Trust funds, and so it's recommended that the City Commission authorize the appropriate city officials to execute the appropriate documents to acquire a mobile command vehicle as presented. And that completes staff presentation. Yeah. Before I accept a motion to improve, I um, want to mention that we are ceasing to meet as a CRA and reconvening as a commission <laughs> in consideration of this um, proposal. Is there a proof? Motion second. Proof and a second. And discussion by commissioners. Question. Yeah, question, commissioner. Is, will this new vehicle um, be put into the replacement fund? Will it, will it start down the road now so that as it's time to replace that one, it'll be, money will be there, is that? I've not, I've not talked to uh, Charlie Dormer or the chief yet to see how they wanted to handle that. If that's the case, then we're going to have to budget for those, uh, for that rent on a monthly basis. And so we'll talk I mean, to them. We got them 31 say, years out of the other one, right. so maybe it's, maybe it's, it's not necessary. It, it, on, on one off pieces of equipment, it's up to the departments as to how they want to do it. If, if the chief thinks that down the road it's another 15 years and they're just going to replace it again with, right. LATF monies, then we, we will Double. step aside. 99% of the pieces of equipment that are owned by the city ought, do actually fall into the fleet fund, but we usually leave that up to the department to, to, to let us know, and, and that would fall into next year's budget. So it'll definitely be something we'll have. Great question. Thank you. And, and typically it would be, it, it, but again, using the, the monies that come in um, from uh, the source that this is coming from, there may be a plan to continue to use that you know, in, in the future yeah. to acquire it and not place it in the fund. Well, those sources always make me nervous because they can go away. Right. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, so. So my understanding is this really doesn't cost the city any money, does it? 
It, it yeah. doesn't come out of the general fund, no, sir. No, no sir. They come, they're, they're monies that are, as, as uh, Assistant Chief Layman, Layman mentioned the other day, they're monies that come to us through task force uh, uh, monies, you know, if we've got folks on a DEA task force or something, and as they get confiscated funds through through drug arrests and those types of things, then at that point, uh, those monies are managed separately and maintained separately uh, via LPD. Do we know how much we've confiscated this year, last year, last five years? I, I don't know off the top of my head. We can absolutely look it up and, and be able to provide that. I can I can email the city manager when we're done with the commission meeting and, and surely tell you uh, what what is there. But uh, Chief Garcia is here. Know. Chief, I don't know if you have that information or if that's something we need to follow back up on with the commission. Okay. We'll we we can absolutely that. get that for you. Okay. We, I, I know we've had a report given to us in the past, so I know dollars accumulate fast so i know we've had that given to us you know years back so that's there any other commissioner comments or questions any from the public on this this is a voice vote all those in favor signify by saying aye aye opposed same unanimously passes that brings us back to city attorney b resolutions one uh, several resolutions for consideration this morning. Uh, first is proposed resolution number 21-050, a resolution of the City Commission pursuant to Section 10 of Division 2 of the Charter of the City of Lakeland relating to civil service, consolidating the list of employee positions accepted from the City's civil service system, accepting the position of emergency manager from civil service, and including the position of management analyst uh, within the civil service system, repealing various resolutions otherwise consolidated herein, making findings, providing an effective date. Move approval. Motion approved and a second by Commissioner Madden. Discussion by commissioners. Seeing none, any discussion by the audience? It's a roll call vote. Commissioner Walker? Aye. 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 And Commissioner McCarley's out of the room. Next is uh, proposed resolution number 21-077, a resolution relating to uh, public utility easements, making findings, vacating an existing seven and a half foot public utility and drainage easement located at 2428 Hogsworth Hill Avenue, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve and a second. Discussion by commissioners. Any discussion or questions by the audience? Um, Commissioner McLeod? Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Um, Next. Unanimously, except for Commissioner McCarley. Next is proposed resolution number 21-078, a resolution relating to fire safety, making findings, Adopting fees for fire safety plans, review, and inspections, and permits, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve and a second. Discussion by commissioners. Commissioner Madden. Thank you, Mayor. And I um, thought I saw our chief here. Just wanted to thank you. It said uh, in our conversations on Friday, this was uh, to address customer concerns and to actually reduce some fees that we charge. So that's always um, noteworthy. Thank you. Any other discussion by commissioners? <coughs> Any discussion or questions by the audience? Um, this is a uh, roll call vote as well, and so that we, Commissioner Walker. Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Unanimously passes. Finally, is proposed resolution number uh, 21 079, a resolution relating to the City of Lakeland, Florida Retiree Health Savings Plan, appointing the Pension Board of the City of Lakeland uh, Employees Pension Plan to serve as the plan administrator, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing an effective date. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. A motion to approve in a second. And discussion by commissioners? Okay. Yes, Commissioner Music. Um, I, not having had this as part of my life, right? I don't do pension boards and plans and stuff like that. Can, I, can we get a 30,000 foot view of like what this really is and what this means? Sure. Uh, essentially, they're, they're, with the retiree health savings plan, as with the other pension plans, there's a, a corpus of money uh, that is, is utilized to generate uh, benefits that are ultimately paid out and it needs to be invested. Okay. And so the pension plan, th through the advice of, of various investment managers that they, they, they uh, utilize, determine which investment vehicles to invest these, these proceeds in. Uh, so they're already doing this with respect to several other plans, our deferred comp plan, uh, 401A plan, that, that type of thing. So it, the, the, 
it's envisioned that they will probably select very similar investment vehicles to invest the, the, the retiree health savings plan uh, funds uh, into, into so. So what this resolution is doing is us giving that board the approval to do that. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Right. I just don't want to say yes for something I'm a little okay. uncertain about. Okay. So. Okay. Good. Any other questions or comments? Anybody the audience? All right. This is a roll call as well. So Commissioner McLeod. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 All right, that was the uh, last of the resolutions, and we have uh, several miscellaneous items uh, for action today. Uh, first is a uh, task authorization with Kaminga and Rudvets. That's item three, right? Correct. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and this is for construction services uh, for uh, uh, the English Oaks Force Main Project, and specifically it is to replace two 10-inch uh, sewer lines with one 20-inch Force Main uh, running from Caribbean Drive, which is, is at the, uh, the frontage road just south of Oak Bridge. It runs along the back side, the east side of Oak Bridge, and will connect up with another 20-inch force main that comes down from the uh, southwest pump station, which is at the corner of Sangill and Edgewood. And what this will, it will really accomplish two things by doing this. First, it will, uh, because of the English force main uh, project, it will expand the capacity quite a bit in those lines, but it will also allow for the change in directions as needed of the flow uh, between, this, between uh, uh, the frontage road and uh, the, the southwest pump station. So segments of the English Oaks line can be taken offline for needed repairs between uh, uh, um, South Florida Avenue and Cleveland High. So it gives us some flexibility as far as performing repairs. Uh, we put this out to bid and received two bids. Uh, the low uh, bidder was Kaminga and Rudvets out of Tampa at $995,939. Uh, their bid was evaluated by city staff as well as our engineer for this project, design engineer for this project, Chastain Skillman. And they were determined to be uh, the, the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. So under this uh, task authorization, they would perform all the, uh, uh, the construction services needed to uh, uh, construct this uh, this project in the total sum of $995,939. This will be funded through a uh, state revolving fund loan through the DEP. This is recommended for your approval. Uh, Robbie Kness is in the audience if you have any technical questions. Motion to approve. Second. And a second by Commissioner Walker. Discussion by commissioners. Any discussion or questions by the audience? This also gives them the ability to bypass so that they can, if, if we have other issues as well, which is important. <coughs> um, uh, this, this is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. Item four. Uh, number four is uh, a construction task authorization also with Kaminga and Rudvets. Uh, this is for some uh, force main upgrades in the Skyview area. Uh, th that area has had a problem with inflow and infiltration, stormwater getting into the, into the, into the, the system, it takes up capacity at our treatment plant, can cause overflows and that type of thing. So uh, what this project will do will be to uh, upgrade uh, an old gravity line between Reynolds Road and Five Iron Drive on Skyview uh, Drive with a new 10-inch force main. It will also ex replace an existing 3-inch line, with, uh, which is, is badly undersized, uh, with a 6-inch force main uh, in, in an area just to the, to the uh, south of Skyview Drive. And this will hopefully correct uh, all of the inflow and infiltration and overflow problems that are being experienced in that area. It was put out to bid. There were three bidders. Uh, Kaminga and Rivets out of Tampa was the low bidder again at $1,009,650. Uh, that was evaluated by city staff and Chastain Skillman. And they were determined to be the lowest responsive responsible bidder. So they will perform all the work under this task authorization to, to uh, uh, upgrade these force mains uh, in the amount of one uh, $1,000,000. $9,650. This is uh, uh, funded in the Water Utilities FY22 budget. Again, we have Robbie Kniss here if you have any technical questions. It's a motion to approve. Second. Motion approved in a second. Um, I'm just curious if we're doing something like this, why we leave it at 10 inches. 10 inches is adequate. Uh, and so just an educational piece. Robbie Kness, engineering manager, water utilities. So on any of these jobs, we have a person in our office, we call them the hydraulic modeler, we have a modeling group. And um, so she analyzes all the expected flows and then that spits out the answer as to the size of the pipe. 
So we usually will consider future growth as well if it makes sense to do so. so. And um, is so the 10 inch failure that exists in the line today is just because of the nature of the pipe? We're actually extending it farther. So it goes a little ways down Skyview and goes into um, a gravity system and then circles through that gravity system before it gets into its last destination. So this is going to bypass that. So it's going to replace an older line um, and then tie it into another force main so it will more efficiently transfer out of the area. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Walker. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess in my thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, when we when we went to the Skyview area to uh, take care of the challenge they were having, I'm going back some years now, and uh, of course the cost was passed on to <coughs> residents in Polk County and all that was in that part of the agreement. This situation did not take care of that? No, it didn't. Um, I think they studied it as much as they could and got it in a situation that Lakeland was willing to accept it then. We've sent, spent a lot of time to understand all the deficiencies. Once we were operating it, can see what all the stations are doing. Yes. And this is just one of still some um, deficiencies that are out there. So this will fix those, but yeah, we'll have to continue so to- We're still monitor. clearing up the challenge that we yes. uh, had to get into and yep. support what was needed out in that area. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Music, do you have a question? I do have a question. So um, are, are you seeing um, supply issues with pipe and things like that? Is that affecting our pricing, our timeline? Where, where are you as a utility department on things like that? It is. It has been difficult, especially with these projects. You know, by the time we get the bid, we evaluate it, we put it on the commission agenda and bring it here. A lot of time passes, and so it's hard to get them to hold their price. So we spend some time... You know, sometimes arguing, sometimes negotiating. Um, hopefully they stake a claim to their price. I've had some discussions with them. Okay. Um, they make their best guess as to what the price is gonna be. Um, I think if they lose a lot of money, they probably come back and talk to us. Yeah. Um, in but some in, cases, in, our, in our ITB, we do have a, hey, we we're, this is the kind of price li or timeline that we're looking yes. so that they can project the best they can. Yep. And yep. Okay. Okay, great. Other questions? Any questions by the audience? All right, this is a uh, roll call vote. And- Voice vote. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. The next item is a uh, uh, consideration of a, uh, a, a form continuing contract and also authority to enter into that continuing contract with various different uh, planning, design, and development services, firms out there. Uh, the uh, city put uh, an RFQ out uh, pursuant to the Consultants Competitive Negotiation Act uh, seeking uh, planning design and development services uh, uh, services from different firms. We had a total of 12 firms respond to the RFQ. A selection committee of uh, CRA, Community Development Public Works Department uh, individuals, uh, staff members, evaluated the bids uh, or the, the responses and uh, after looking at what all the different 12 firms had to offer, decided that we should go ahead and enter into continuing contracts with all these firms. They all have different areas of expertise, so it would make sense to go ahead and get them all under a master contract. Any specific work that is done pursuant to that continuing, continuing contract would be under a task authorization where we would negotiate a not to exceed amount, a schedule, uh, and, and the scope of work. So this, this does not involve any, any dollar amount, it's just simply uh, picking these 12 firms to enter into master agreements with. That's recommended for your approval. Move for approval. Second. Motion to approve in a second. And any questions by commissioners? Any questions by the audience? This is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. There's no report from the finance director, so that brings us to the unapproved utility items three and four. And one, we took one off. Oh, and, and one. Is that is one? We pulled that off on right. Friday. Bad. Good morning, Ramona Siriani for the City Attorney's Office. The first item that we have is an amendment number one to uh, an existing agreement that we have with Ap Apogee Interactive for website application and design services. 
the city um, has approved, has been in an existing contract with this particular firm for the past five years. And in entering into that contract, the purpose of that was to, um, to provide a tool set and web redesign for Lakeland Electric customers that incorporated a variety of web-based uh, energy management tools to take advantage of smart grid data, as well as um, updated design and navigation. What we, the amendment here today uh, intends to expand that existing tool set um, for further educa education engagement of customers in the areas of electric vehicles and demand rates as well. Uh, specific to this amendment, Apogee will be providing um, an enhanced energy advisor services to the web Lakeland Electric's website, um, coined to save money energy tool set area. They will design and implement a special purpose calculator for electric vehicles, uh, design and implement a demand rate tool set upon your approval. Uh, the Apogee will take uh, engage in services starting November 1st, 2021, and they anticipate completing that project by October of next year in 2022. All those services uh, are, will be completed in accordance with the terms and conditions in the original services agreement as well as in this amendment. The total cost will be $88,000. That is included in Lakeland uh, Electric's FY22 budget. I know at agenda study on Friday, there were some, maybe some technical questions. I think Mr. Mayor had a question and Commissioner Madden would, uh, wanted to maybe further discuss, which was why it was removed um, off of the consent. And I think Dave Cuss is here to address any um, other specifics on the project, if you have any questions. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Move for approval. Second. And a second, okay. And discussion, Commissioner Madden. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I just thought it was important since uh, Scott Bishop had mentioned that this enhancement was coming when he gave the presentation for uh, emerging technology and things to be looking for. I hated to have it just be approved without, you know, kind of giving it a shout out at the meeting. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting in this is that, you know, knowing that in President Biden's um, initiative to add 500,000 charging stations throughout the country, you, know, you can look at EV adoption and kind of think, you get sleepy about the discussion because it's happened slowly. Um, but if there's expedited adoption and there are charging stations emerging that we don't know where they are, I think we had a discussion that we don't even know where ours are in Lakeland. Um, that's one of the things in this improvement that we'll be able to, with a map, be able to find out where charging stations are near me. Um, and so I didn't know if uh, Scott Bishop or Dave or somebody would like to just maybe just give us, um, you know, some of the key things to be looking for as an enhancement with regard to emerging technology and smart city applications. David can do that for us, I'm sure. Good morning, Dave Cuss, Assistant General Manager of Lincoln Electric Customer Service. Uh, we're pretty excited about this project. Uh, we know that uh, the future, at least at Lincoln Electric, electric vehicles and peak demand management are gonna play a key role. Uh, these tools will help our customers understand and engage with us, as well as better understand uh, the costs and the benefits of the first one, electric vehicles. So among the things with the electric vehicles, uh, we anticipate the vendor will create tools to let the consumer, one, do a price comparison, among the differing uh, manufacturers and models that are coming out. Price comparisons for what it will cost you to charge at home versus at other stations, uh, what it does to your Lake and Electric bill to charge your vehicle. Uh, if you're on standard rate versus time of use or peak demand rates, there will be a difference in what it costs you to charge that vehicle. Uh, so those tools will be a, a click or two away for each of our customers. So on the electric vehicle side, it's uh, education, uh, as well as cost management. And of course, as you mentioned, Commissioner, uh, we will have that map of where all the local, both local and state charging stations are uh, for consumers, regardless of which make or model they have. Uh, another piece of this is the peak demand management piece. We also anticipate that peak demand uh, is gonna play a bigger role in Lake Electric and for our customers. So we want tools in place to better help the customers. Now, peak demand is not just for customers on demand, mate, Durant, demand rate, it's also for our solar customers. Uh, one of the tools that all of our small commercial residential customers have uh, is the ability to see what your bill is gonna be in advance and alerts that tell you the progress you're making financially throughout the month. 
We don't have that for the solar or the peak demand customers. So one of the tools we're going to implement is that early warning that says you're about to hit your peak uh, next 24 or 48 hours. So here are some changes you can make to reduce your peak demand. Uh, we think that'll put us among the industry leaders in managing peak uh, load with our consumers as well as with the utility. So it's uh, EV education and cost management as well as peak demand education and cost management. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, thank you, Dave. So the save money tool set, the enhancement of that, is that the uh, notification of you're about to reach this peak demand, or is there, is there something else in that category that you're planning to add as part of this project? That's that's the primary one for the peak one, uh, and, th and that's pretty complex uh, because that data has to be nearly real time, mm -hmm. uh, and there has to be some logic built into this to understand your behavior pattern if you're on a peak rate, because your peak is literally set within 30 minutes. So we've got to come within 30 minutes of real time to give you a, a warning to say, here's what's coming. Uh, versus our right now for residential and commercial customers, we predict your next bill so that you can take steps during the course of the month if you're a third of the way through or half of the way through uh, to help manage your bill amount. With demand, it's a, it's a tougher challenge because you're going to hit it within a 30 minute period and we have to predict that. Can you get an email or text or how? Both. You, both. Okay. Right. So if you're currently a residential or commercial, small commercial customer, you can get an email or text to say, listen, you're halfway through the month, you're at $70. If you keep doing what you're doing, it's going to be $140. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can set the level of that alert to a dollar amount that's comfortable for you. I do that now. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Close. And um, just to uh, piggyback on, I guess, what uh, my colleague, Commissioner, um, Man was sharing. I, I just was flabbergasted, I guess, at the FMEA conference recently that we were, we were both at, and uh, was to hear about EVs and how it, our country is moving toward more of that. And that's when I came back and thought, where, where are our electric charges, Texas, around Lakeland? <clears throat> Excuse me. And thankfully, we did get a map to show some, uh, I guess, areas where we were. I knew about the one, I guess, at North Lakeland of 98 there at the Wawa, and the one at the, the, the donut, uh, was it Dunkin' Donuts at 98 in Griffin, but I didn't know about others, of course. And But I, I saw where, interestingly enough, by the year, I think it was 2035, was it, Stephanie? I think 2035, how, much, how many EV vehicles are going to be uh, uh, here in our country, and people are using EVs as opposed to what we use now for getting around as far as all the, uh, for automation, I mean, for traffic or driving. And I thought, wow, you know, we, it's going to be a drastic change here. And this is year 21, 22 almost. And next, what, 10, 12 years, seeing how, you know, uh, EVs will be on the roads as much as more as, um, you know, I call your kind of standard vehicles. So I, I'm glad to see we're moving forward with what we need to do to make sure our community is, is set and ready to be able to support our citizenry when it comes to EVs and we're, we're charging stations or that kind of thing as well. So thank you. Right, and the accessibility of those things is important when you're on a road trip yes. for high-speed charging stations. Of course, as Mr. Cusp is explaining, when we charge at home at night, that's a different planable, be off-demand rate time to be able to do that as well, that people can schedule them as mm -hmm. they go. Um, so, but you, I, I notice them increasingly on in the city all the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, you see more and more electric vehicles, <clears throat> and of course, hybrids work in this arena as well. Uh, so, but there are, you know, Tesla's only electric, so there is no motor. It's just four motors on four wheels. All right. Um, any other comments? There is no engine. There's just four motors. All right. Any questions or comments from the public? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. Item three. Uh, Ramona Siriani for the City Attorney's Office again. Uh, this is an agreement with Schneider Electric Smart Grid Solutions LLC. This is for an upgrade to Lakeland Electric's existing graphical work order electric electronic distribution design application and corresponding uh, interfaces with Maximo as well as our GIS platform. This particular uh, existing package, also known as designer, is something that Lakeland Electric staff 
uh, uses to design and maintain the utility's transmission distribution and lighting system. Uh, the existing version 10.6.1 is fully integrated and dependent on our Esri client server online um, GIS, as well as, as, as I mentioned, Maximo. However, the current version, the reason for the upgrade is the current version is, will be de-supported by Schneider at the end of 2023, um, which would cause a number of operating uh, uh, concerns related to exposure to security breach or op other operational concerns. Uh, the city's purchasing department did approve this as a sole source purchase because Schneider is the original uh, system provider for the work. Uh, pursuant to the agreement, Schneider will provide a scope of work that includes upgrading the GIS and its extension to from 10.6.1 to the 10.8.1 version, um, also upgrading it to the interface with the GIS to 10.8.1, and also uh, updating and rewriting the designer Maximo interface to ensure compatibility mm -hmm. among those three. Uh, it will also include necessary training, uh, user, and testing and support. Uh, the total cost of the project is $1,009,549. Uh, it's anticipated upon your approval that the project will kick off uh, sometime in October, and then will take approximately 18 months to complete the project, which should be done in March of 2023. Uh, the work is governed in accordance with the agreement, and, the t and again, that total cost of $1,009,549 is included both in Lakeland Electric's FY22 budget, which the portion of that that's included is $800,000. The remainder will be subject to approval by the commission in the FY23 budget. We'd ask for your favorable approval. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. And a second on the two ends. And discussion by commissioners. Yeah, Commissioner Music. Um, so two things. One, if I understood what you were saying here, the part of it is FY22, and then part of it is FY23. Yeah. But we haven't approved FY23 yet, so Correct. we're going to be in a little bit of a position because we're approving something that's going to be the majority done. So the I mean, majority. it'll be a little bit of a moot point. Right. Well, I mean, I think as the it is an 18 month project, so it'll it will carry over. Um, and as there's milestone payments, it's not going to be a lump sum payment um, as the work progresses. And and how often? When was the last time this was uh, when it was installed? I guess correct. Right. This is this is the first upgrade on that. I believe so. I don't. I think we have Lakeland Electric staff that can tell you when our Tracy Kirkpatrick. Good morning, Tracy Kirkpatrick, Information morning, Technology Andrew. GIS Manager. Uh, this product gets upgraded, a minor upgrade, about every two or three years. Uh, this is uh, a major change in the architecture of the platform, the moving more towards a web application platform. Some of this will be continually hosted moving forward. Gotcha, okay. We anticipate uh, probably one more upgrade in the next couple of years after this one, and then we'll be on this brand new architecture. It should last without another major architectural change, probably eight to 10 years. Oh, okay, good. Right, thank you. Good questions. Any other questions by commissioners? Any by the audience? This is a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Unanimously passes. The last item on the utility portion is an agreement with Eaton Corporation. This is for low voltage motor controls for Larson Power Plant. Uh, these motor controls are essential to the operation of Unit 8. Um, they were originally installed in the mid-1960s and are now um, in need of replacement. There's been a variety of recent failures that, have, that has caused Larson Unit 8 uh, not to be available for service to run um, in important upgrading this uh, necessary to upgrade to employ new technology as well. The city's purchasing department has approved Eaton as a sole source supplier for the low voltage motor controls. Uh, upon approval by the city commission, a purchase order will be issued to Eaton, who will then deliver the motor controls, um, and that will be uh, um, <coughs> scheduled for uh, completion, the project, and the spring outage for Larson, which will take place in March 2022. 
The motor controls, however, will be installed by a third-party contractor during the spring outage, which will be a separate bid that will come to you um, sometime in the near future for approval. The purchase of the motor controls will be governed by the terms and conditions in Eaton's proposal. Uh, the total cost of the work is $208,709.23 and is included in Lakeland Electric's FY22 budget, and we'd ask for your favorable approval. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. And a second. Discussion by commissioners. Just have one uh, Commissioner Music. Yeah, um, Ramona, so I just, I mean, I'm sure that it's in there, but just as out of curiosity for me, th this is the same situation. I mean, we're, we're having proposals come on these products that, and we've seen um, supply chain issues. We've seen all these things, but this is obviously things you guys have in the negotiations, in the contract, and you're to, to cover that or Correct. a percentage and, at least. And Again, this won't occur, this work won't occur till the spring right. 2022, 2022 outage. Um, and that's why a lot of these things that you see have a, long, a longer lead time built in because we have to order the parts. Okay. And so those can come in and then they can be installed. Yeah. Okay. So. Excellent. Other questions by commissioners? Any by the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Nasty passes. For those of you who have patiently waited in the audience, we are now at the audience participation portion of the, of the meeting, and anyone who would like to come one at a time, just come to the front, and you'll have three minutes for your comments. Just state your name and address, please. Everybody else can hear that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You're not. <laughs> the ring is this microphone, Mr. Manager. The ring is this microphone. Nobody's standing here. It creates that ring. All right. So. Uh, hi, my name is Jonathan Freed. Uh, I'm. Uh, I live at 7805 Fox Squirrel Circle, Lakeland, Florida. Uh, first of all, I want to give an apology to Commissioner Madden, Commissioner uh, Reed, and Commissioner McLeod. I started at the center of the desk earlier and moved to the right and didn't go to the left. I try to avoid the left. Uh, anyway, we'll leave that at that. Uh, again, my name is uh, Jonathan Freed. I'm the pastor of mm -hmm. Believers Fellowship Church here in Lakeland, Florida. And um, the, the foundation and the guidance of Scripture has been proven to be the only way to sustain a moral people in a thriving society. In the Bible, the Ten Commandments are given, of which one of those commandments, you shall not murder, and those laws are the root of our nation, of the United States of America, and also even of Lakeland, Florida. Those Judeo-Christian values coming from the Bible, they've been depicted in artistry, engraving stonework on all sorts of monuments, courthouses, civic buildings, and they, they stand to uphold our nation in its moral fabric and its foundation. Murder, specifically, is illegal in all of its very fo various forms, except for one, abortion. The city of Lakeland has enacted measures of various types in its good intention to protect the life, the health, and the well-being of its citizens. Lakeland and the such surrounding community of Polk County has eliminated strip clubs or other such establishments for the betterment of, of a community. If the city took such an action against that kind of immoral establishment, then I believe it's possible to do the same concerning the abortion establishments abortion clinics that are within the city of Lakeland, and I would hope even push beyond into the Polk County area. I understand that as the city commission, you generally act on behalf of the desires of the citizens. So therefore, I'm here today not just to speak to you as a council, but also to my fellow citizens and using this stage as that privilege. My fellow citizens, a moral failure, a blight such as abortion should not exist in our community. And we, as a moral and biblical people, should rise up and put an end to it. So today, I call out my fellow pastors in the city of Lakeland, church leaders, religious leaders in this community, to say, take a stand, be bold and courageous, even as God commanded Joshua. Recognize the strength of your voice and the obligation of your authority given by God. Join us, join together, in the fight to end the greatest crime against humanity, come together in unity with the word of God 
and with each other to put an end to abortion in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Just please come right up front. State your name, please, and address. My name is Katie Burns, and I live here in the city of Lakeland. I'd like to remind all of us that we have something in common with the unborn. At one time in our past, we were the unborn. But we stand here now enjoying our unalienable rights, our God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I would like to see Lakeland become the sanctuary for the unborn so that they too can enjoy those same rights which belong to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mildred Pergon. I concur with my pastor and with the lady there. When I was a young girl, I did a stupid mistake, and I don't want another person in, in Lakeland, young lady, make a mistake. We as the church should be there for anyone that finds themselves pregnant. Having an abortion does not answer the, anything. That it's not a mistake when we have a baby. So I'm against abortion, and I hope we do shut down the clinic. And uh, that's all I got to say. I don't want my kids think that they can go to 44, 44 Women's Health and think that getting an abortion is gonna cure what's happening in our country. And if we don't stop the murdering in Lakeland, the blessings will stop coming to Lakeland. Are there any other comments from the public at all? Thank you very much for those thoughtful comments as well. All right, that ends that portion of our meeting, and now we go to Commissioner Comments. Uh, Commissioner Mann. Thank you. I, typically, I wouldn't want to run, rush to be first, but um, with such uh, uh, thoughtful audience participation today, I wanted to really comment on that before I got to my... Good. So it's a very emotional issue for me, and I'll say that in four years of being on the commission, I've not had anyone come and ask that question to this body that I know of. So I certainly don't know, um, as from a legal perspective, you know, what, what options we have with that regard. But I will certainly make sure that we do request our city attorney ask if there are such opportunities to make those kind of um, ordinances <coughs> within a city. Um, thank you for coming. I know that. For a long time, the division of church and state has led to kind of such a separation that we don't hear a lot from church goers or particularly pastors, except for in the prayer that we have, which comes before our actual meeting so that we can keep that uh, separation of church and state. But as citizens who love this city, we hope that you will come and share your heart. Everyone else does. <laughs> We have all kinds of um, folks with all kinds of passions and requests from zoning changes and things that affect their neighborhood that come and speak to us. We've been here to 1130 at night um, hearing uh, public discussion about things that they feel will affect their quality of life. And so I can't thank you enough as someone who um, is passionate about that issue to have citizens come and to speak to us today about that. We've not had that. That's a first for me. My um, comments other than that um, are, first of all, and which is kind of in the same line, is that Lakeland being so rich with nonprofits, and I'll add churches to that, uh, all kinds of churches. Um, we talked about today some award-winning projects that we had, and one was when we partnered with Talbot House. And one of the issues that plagues our country with homelessness, affordable housing, is just when you just give someone a house without those wraparound services, without that nonprofit support from the community, often it uh, is an abysmal failure because there are issues of the heart and issues that are physical that need to be uh, addressed 
to get people back on track and get back with where they can live in a house. Um, and so it was fun to see that today we were able to show that Vermont Play success story when we partnered um, with Talbot House as a city. Those are things that we can cross governmental and religious or governmental and nonprofit boundaries and we can shake hands and work together and have more skin in the game and come up with more beautiful city and better projects because of that. And so I'm a big believer in collaboration and P3s. Um, today, or last Thursday, I was able to go to the Dream Center event and it was so exciting after, you know, two years of pandemic and uh, being quarantined and, and separated to see uh, the house packed with folks who are dedicated to make a difference and who um, to see our police officers and our chief was there to talk, um, come together with all kinds of churches and our colleges and the community really, you know, grabbing hands together to do community cleanups and to Im impact our neighborhoods. The government alone can't do those things. We need to have the support of our community partners. Um, and so that was exciting to go to the Dream Center last week. And then this Thursday, Talbot House is having their banquet. So I'm excited that um, several of us will be able to participate with that as well. We also got to hear, of course, with Parker Street. Again, you can give people a house, but when you give them the gospel, when you give them uh, support services that the nonprofits bring, that's what really starts to just change the hearts and lives. And, and we get to be um, the beneficiaries of that hard work. And I think it was one of my colleagues down here said, how do you put a dollar um, on, on that uh, rich benefit that we get from partnering with religious, nonprofit, all of, uh, well, all of those partners. So um, excited about that um, for this week with Talbot House. The other thing I'm excited about certainly is always innovation and I try to highlight it whenever I can. And so Leadership Lakeland approached me about doing the revisited. I know my colleague Commissioner McCarley did it last year on homelessness or, or maybe the year before um, and asked me what I thought you know, we, we should focus on. And of course, if I get a chance to pick, then it's gonna be innovation. So um, we're doing Ignited Innovation and Scott Bishop is gonna lead us out and talk to the group on Thursday um, afternoon at LE. LE is so graciously hosting the group to be able to talk about some innovation here um, at LE, give them some you know, fun things about hydrogen and electric vehicles and such, and then travel out to um, Florida Poly to get a tour and see what's happening out there, and then to finish off at SunTrax. So I don't know if we've missed the deadline, but any leadership at Lakeland alumni, if you'd like to participate, that's on Thursday. And finally, one of my favorite things, um, well, there's so many favorite things I have in the city of Lakeland, but one of them is tomorrow at 7 a.m. we're having the Swan Roundup. Is that still on? We're yes. Yeah. Still and on. so last year I got to hold, <laughs> hold the Swan for the first time, and so I'm hoping maybe I'll get a, a second chance at that. So if you're up early, um, they'll be driving the boat around Lake Morton and collecting all the swans so that they can get all their vaccinations and get all their um, get their uh, doctor checkup. So that is what I have for today. Any other commissioners wish to share? Commissioner Walker. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on last week, last Monday, uh, a week ago today, we had our I guess we call it our final meeting for the year. Uh, for our gang task force, and that was a second. That was the second time we've only met face to face in in the past year, um, and certainly uh, we were displeased to hear how things were coming along, and sharing with uh, the the group of our, our team. I was saying thank you to both Mayor uh, Mutz and um, Commissioner McLeod for being in the meeting. They got to hear some of the things that we we share and discuss uh, routinely. Uh, about situations that um, com really concerns our community as a whole, but certain areas that we find to be a little challenging. And I was glad to hear, even though you hate to hear numbers as such, uh, about any kind of a uh, crime element, but we only had for, for, the, for the current 10 months here of our year of 21, only 28 incidents. And I thought that was, Wow, that's good, you know, to hear about that number being that low, even though you want you want zero, and you work toward getting zero as best you can, but none of those uh, they can really say were uh, gang-related in itself. And that was good to hear. 
So um, and there could be other uh, reporting that will come. I did not have the actual numbers from uh, from Captain Thompson who gave the report for um, the meeting on that on that on that day. But we're moving forward. Um, there's uh, the L we call the RTL Refuse to Lose initiative. It got birthed out of the gang task force some several years back that we want to continue and continue to make sure that we keep that particular initiative going among our youth, especially our youth in some more challenging communities around our city. Um, and we think that's uh, both with parents and children signing up to be uh, part of that initiative, which is done, because parents actually sign a form along with the children or youth about situations regarding uh, uh, misguided steps they may take in that kind of thing. And um, so we hope that you know, that will continue to, to be what we can take forward. And, and as I've said, even the meeting on, this, on last Monday, similar to, you know, and I hate to use even the ill of prostitution or drugs, uh, both those ills being uh, things that we deal with in our communities is not going away. I don't see, you know, certain activity we see crime related going away, but certainly we make sure that we have things in place where we can keep um, <coughs> innovative kind of uh, projects going to keep those numbers down as best we can. I, I plan on having a talk with, um, I've already mentioned to City Manager Shiraz, along with uh, Chief Garcia, on some movement I think we need to make, see, maybe take forward uh, and another talk with them, bring to you all as my colleagues on, on what direction will we see the gang task force moving. Uh, again, we want to continue to keep the uh, refuse to lose initiative going as best we can. There's dollars already been appropriated for that particular use through uh, our neighborhood services with um, Mr. Jonathan Rodriguez uh, being uh, at the forefront of that. But I want to make sure you all heard some numbers and see some things, uh, hear about some things that's still taking place to keep our communities safe as best we can from that kind of violence. Outside of that, I want to make sure people don't forget about the upcoming uh, Hispanic Festival this coming weekend, you know, uh, uh, that we have here. Another way that we're trying to make sure that we keep uh, all of our communities engaged in different cultural aspects. And we cannot wait until we see the new Lakeland History and Culture Center unveiling, you know, we have a date to set for March 11th, as you know, and as the community would know about that particular center, uh, the actual gallery that would depict situa uh, situations of, uh, where all facets of, of, of people uh, from all walks of life who have contributed to make sure Lakeland continue to be the kind of embracing community we want to have for diversity and inclusion for all our different uh, areas of our city. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Music. Yeah, and I'll have an opportunity to say this one more time um, beforehand, but November 2nd, we have an election, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, you're, you're, whenever I go to the, the meetings that we have, we're always preaching to the choir, right? I mean, the people that are here, you guys are the ones that are engaged. Those that are watching are the ones that are engaged. But you're going to find out that the day after the election that that 20 percent of the people voted and that's you know that's it's it's annoying it's frustrating it's all kinds of, of adjectives but at the end of the day um you know we we have an opportunity to come we talk about transparency you know and commissioner madden probably does a better job than the rest of us to explain why it is that we're doing some of the things that we do for for transparency and clarity for you all but but if you get out and vote then you know that you've done all you can do you're showing up here you're you're watching and interacting um, on the, the different various sources we have to get this out. But I'll be able to tell you one more day, one more time before, but get out and vote. All right, thank you very much. Yep. And you're right, Commissioner uh, McCarla. Thank you, you almost said Matt. I did. <laughs> um, thank well, thank you, Mayor Mutz. I just wanted to echo what Commissioner um, Music just said, that voting is imperative, especially in municipal elections. We don't always have the turnout that we would like and that we hope for. But I also want to thank, I don't know if many of my peers know this, I know that um, the mayor does, but Commissioner Music did something last week at a candidate forum that is highly unusual for a political person, and I just publicly have to thank him that he used half of his time to defend my work on the commission, and that's not something you see in politics, which is one of the 
greatest things about serving the city of Lakeland is because people like Commissioner Music and all of my fellow commissioners up here, we are a nonpartisan body. We support one another. We um, support engagement with all citizens. But I just wanted to say thank you publicly because it was not only chivalrous, but it was as non-political as you possibly could be. So I wanted to give him kudos for that. Um, and, and just, and also remind voters this is nonpartisan. I mean, we come up here and we wrestle with all sorts of issues that you've seen today. Um, and we are, try to be as nonpartisan as we potentially can be. And that's just one of the blessings of serving in a local capacity and serving local government and a municipality. And by the way, we're the ones who care about how your garbage gets picked up. And when you start moving up the food chain into state and federal laws, they don't care as much about you know what happens to you on a daily basis, and we all do. So I just want to commend you and say thank you publicly, and then also commend my fellow commissioners because everyone is very supportive of one another, and, and I'm, I'm sure that will continue. I would wholly concur. Uh, Commissioner Reed. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been fighting a sore throat, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys can tell. Um, <laughs> I know we don't sound like this, but um, so again, you know, we're, we're Lakeland, the city of city of lakes, and uh, Lake Hollingsworth's about 300, and a little bit less than 360 acres, and we have a beautiful walkway going around it. And if you can go there, uh, probably at three o'clock in the morning, you got a good chance of seeing somebody walk in the lake. And of course, the same thing. Lake Parker's about 1,800 acres or plus. We just finished up that big trail to the west side. And the, the HOA has contacted me and the, the extreme southwest corner uh, appears to be turning into a marsh. I don't know, I need to probably get with, we can contact Lori a little bit and something, but there's some old tires. I can see the tires laying out there around the area that are in the water. And uh, we, I know we're getting this new, have we gotten a new machine yet that yes. we can? Oh, yeah. Is this here? Oh, yeah. Well, I, well, I wrote on it. This was yeah, good. I need, to, I need to. I need to. I need to. I'm going to ride on maybe take a fishing pole at the same time. I don't know. But um, uh, if you look at that, if you ride around, look at this, this old part around behind the old Holiday Inn. It's it's almost uh, mm -hmm. it's just a floating vegetation entirely. It's, it's maybe a tenth of the lake in, in that area. But I don't know what else we can do about it. And then. Uh, you know, we, we raised the, water, the fees there for the lake cleanup a couple of years ago. Maybe we need to examine that again or something like that. But uh, in the end, I just told them I'd bring it up. And Thank you. We'll look into it. Yeah. <clears throat> and that is the lake that they have taken probably the most vegetation out of, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. we're almost three months so. in there, three or four months in there mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. well, hauling out trucks and right. trucks and trucks right. and trucks and trucks. It never stops, does it? Uh, Commissioner McLeod. Thank you, Mayor. And speaking of supporting our fellow commissioners, I wanted to follow up on last week's TPO, Transportation Planning Organization meeting, because we had a discussion, and I think we all got an email from Brian Ruiz about the request to add to the, the TPO's 2045 uh, long-range plan, a project to expand Highway 98 north uh, from West Socrum Loop road to the Pasco County line, and we had a lot of discussion about that uh, on Thursday, and I thought Commissioner McCarley appropriately brought up some concerns uh, about that, and and not necessarily, it was clear to me that uh, from the, the TPO that is made up of other municipalities and representatives from the County Commission and, uh, and a number of us, uh, that I think it will receive support from, from that group. Uh, but I, I wonder, is this an opportunity for us as a city to, to raise concerns? And I, I talked to Chuck Barnby, and I don't know if Chuck or somebody from Community and Economic Development wants to pop back in, but I talked to him after that meeting. And I, I thought, I wish I had talked to him before the meeting, but maybe it's a chance for us to say as a city, we have concerns about uh, projects that we don't have commitments from, from FDOT. So uh, the I-4, State Road 33, the uh, 98 from um, Crystal Lake down to Edgewood and, and projects that are on the plan already and we're concerned that you know maybe they're falling below on the priority list and so is there a way for, for us as a city as a commission maybe we don't oppose it uh, you know uh, outright on the TPO but to use this as an opportunity to stand up and say hey we're really concerned about these local projects that have been on our list for for a long time so I wanted to bring that back to this group to get your thoughts and maybe from a staff perspective just to know 
where we are and the concerns we had. I appreciate Commissioner McCarley bringing that up and raising the issue, and hopefully we can. And I, yes. I think we plan to talk a little bit during our legislative meeting at one o'clock. Excellent. That's going to okay. pop up at that yeah. point in time. So okay. We definitely Perfect. will delve into it. Yeah. And it needs to be done then too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's time to do it. Anything from our staff that you'd like to share? No, sir. All right. Thank you. All good. Uh, no, sir. <laughs> All right. good. May Every Mayor, the, the only thing is um, uh, there is a break uh, provided uh, for the commissioners in the in the break room, and then we we have sent a, a link now for the noon um, go to meeting. So that'll be from each of our offices through the go to link. Great. That'll give us 22 minutes to spend any way we'd like eating. <laughs> and if there's no other matters uh, before this audience, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.